This episode of the Beancast is brought to you by Artisanal Agency, the exclusive representative of the This Week in Tech podcast network. Reach twit.tv's tech-savvy, affluent, highly engaged audience by booking your campaign now. Visit artisanalagency.com to find out more. Bandwidth provided by Recursive Squirrel Interactive. Visit them on the web at recursivesquirrel.com. Episode 573, the 2019 Year-End Review. December 23rd, 2019. It's time for this special year-end edition of the Beancast, an annual look at the biggest topics we covered over the last year. I'm your host, Bob North. Thanks for joining us. Well, another year down, and for the 11th time, we look back on the biggest stories of the past year. For those of you new to the program, get ready for a fast-paced ride with some of your favorite Beancast panelists blending their wisdom and wit. Tonight, we'll talk about everything from 5G's promise to Facebook's failings, along with a healthy dose of political intrigue. Plus, for the first time ever, the best of the fair, fail, foul. That's the lineup. Let's meet tonight's panel. Thanks for joining us for this week's Beancast. I'm Bob Norp, and with me on the panel for this evening, we start with the Admiral of the HMS Beagle, author, speaker, pundit, Mr. Joseph Jaffe. Joe, welcome. Uh, It is always great to be on the year-end episode of the Beancast. Thank you for inviting me, my friend. It's a big honor. I give it out very, very carefully, so (laughs) I'm glad you can make it, Joe. Now, next, we welcome back the CEO of both Artisanal Agency and Twit.tv, Ms. Lisa Laporte. Lisa, hi. Hi, Bob. Happy holidays, and I appreciate you inviting me to the end of the year show. Yeah, it was your first time coming, so we're really excited to have you on the program. And finally, he's the host of the marketing podcast Across the Pond, digital transformation expert, Mr. Samuel Mani. Sam, Hi. <laughs> Hey, Bob. Hey, everybody. I am so excited to be on this end of year show because it's been a wonderful year and it's the end of the decade. How should we talk about it and bring in the new? Well, we're going to find out in just a minute. Now, you all know the rules. No body checking, no cursing, no illegal hand gestures and no whining. Definitely no whining. Just good, clean debate. (laughs) Y'all ready? (laughs) Um, I think you got the wrong guy for that. (laughs) Well, let's start off with a big topic from the early part of the year that became kind of questionable as we went along. Amazon and a whole bunch of others are reinventing the retail space. They're making physical spaces cool again. At the same time, Joe, we're seeing massive retail closing everywhere. Stores are closing left and right. Which is it? Is it is retail back? Is it you know cool again, or is this just a, a fallacy? And a whole bunch of stores that are coming open and being reinvested in are just going to close in the next year or so. What's going to happen? What's going on? Yes. No. Yes. <laughs> yes to both. Yes to both. It really, and I'm not even trying to be uh, uh, you know be snarky about it. It's true. Mm-hmm. Both of those are happening at the same time. Um, you know, I've spent a lot of time focused on retail. I've written a lot on this as well. And I think the reality is, is that if you actually just look at it almost a, a, as, a, as a real estate play, one of the biggest problems with the incumbents, with the 800-pound gorillas in the space, is that they have way too much overhead and too much real estate for ultimately what they're peddling. Um, and, and so, you know, like I spoke about it in actually in Built to Suck, which is, how do you save Barnes and Noble? You save Barnes and Noble by halving the footprint of the actual store and maybe then subletting or subleasing the remainder of the store, let's say to artisans or 
or a farmer's market or complementary type of experiential players. Aren't you describing so, the retail mall? I mean, it's just like I thought malls were dying too because uh, it's uh, or, or are we talking more like these artisanal shops that are popping up everywhere around the country? Well, it, well, it was, well I mean, I mean, y- yes and no. The, the the actual mall has got a much uh, is a much more complicated conversation and more difficult challenge and save because of the anchor tenant theory, uh, because of these massive parking lots that may not be necessary with self-driving cars or shared vehicles, autonomous vehicles. But I think the biggest challenge that we have with the shopping mall uh, is the falling and failing of, of the anchor tenant. So yes, a lot of these malls have tried to create, I mean, just look at the, it, it's unbelievable for those of you that are on the East Coast, uh, and I forget the name, I'm sure one of my uh, cohorts will remember it, or you'll remember it, but this this more that this white elephant in New Jersey with a, with a ski slope, with an ice rink, with a, a tropical rainforest. I don't even know what the hell uh, they have in it, but it's finally opened up. And so I think malls have realized that if they don't triple and quadruple on experiential, they don't have a snowball's chance. And I don't mean that as a pun because there's a, a ski slope. I think that's an, important, that's an important point to make. And I wonder if anybody else has any comments on that. The fact that um, experience plays such an important part in this and that what what so many of the retailers that are succeeding in physical spaces are providing is some kind of experience that makes the physical necessary as opposed to just being retail focused and selling goods. Um, well, well, I want to throw out, too, um, the, the thing that intrigues me the, the most about Amazon opening up new stores is they're really doing it for data. You have to remember, they're tracking mm. people when they come in. They're picking up products. They know what they're picking up and looking at. Amazon's doing these physical stores not only give you a little bit of a feel of what the products are, but they're doing it for the data. And having just got back from Dubai and have seen their ski slopes and malls and things like that, I agree that that's pivoting more to an experiential um, you know, commitment where you'll walk into a mall and there's a movie theater and you can go skiing, you can go skating. But I, Amazon's really opening these fil- physical retail stores for data and convenience for people who want to go in there. So I think that's something intriguing to really take a look at. But I think also Amazon's opening up for because they, they've only got they're only playing 10 percent of the market. So if 90 percent of the total market is actual physical retail, then they're trying to be part of that pie as much as they are trying to be part of the online experience. But I, I'd, I'd agree with you as well. I think the, there is this idea of data and information, but also we're human beings until the AI robots and algorithms take over. We actually like experiential things and That's touching great. things and receiving things and, and you know, unwrapping Christmas presents um, a few days early, but you know, and then posting it on Instagram. So there is this element of experiential that I think we're all as humans up for. So I, I just think they're just playing part in what we what we care about as human beings, and I don't think that's anything new. There's always a, a reinvention of retail happening. And it, will, it will continue to happen, and it will continue to happen in the future. And I think and I think there's no question that digital plays an absolutely mission critical role in terms of this re-emergence or resurgence of bricks and mortar. So anybody that says bricks and mortar is dead, I think don't know really what they're talking about. The reality, though, is that when we need more context, and that context is looking at these incumbents that expanded over years and even decades way too much, and therefore now need to contract in order to survive and, and and maybe see a kind of uh, a phase two in their in their life cycle. Speaking of contracting and coming into some kind of uniform approach to selling your goods, Facebook plans to migrate all of their apps to a common platform. In a year that we talked about Facebook causing problems left and right, and we talked about Facebook maybe needing to be broken up, Facebook has reacted by bringing it all in on a common platform, calling everything by Facebook. I mean, guys, what's going on here with with the Facebook space? I mean, is this a good play for them? And is it good for consumers? Is this how we're going to what's going to be the result of them trying to consolidate everything under a common platform in order to avoid being broken up? Well, for me, it's just it's the it's the they become the man. They are the establishment. They are they are the status quo. And what what more um, could you could be more status quo than you know, putting a fence around all of your stuff. It's almost like a badge of honor. And I can see the 
sort of the, the, the statues of the founders and all the people who are building this infrastructure. It just feels like something a, a big conglomerate, a big corporate company would do. And they are living into that. So for me, this as we move into the new decade, it's great to see what comes next because they cannot, they, they can't grow anymore. They can't get any bigger. They can't own more stuff and they can't do more stuff. So for me, I'm excited about where the challenges and the innovation is going to come from. And if you look at, um, if you, you know, as you start looking at who's advising the Mark um, the Zuckerbergs of this world, you're seeing Peter Thiel's name come up. And as you start to see who they're taking advice from, again, it's the it's the big moneyed institution status quo. And I'm I'm hopeful that this is a sign that they're actually losing sight of being ch a challenger and an innovator. And other other companies, other organisations, other um, other industries, other types of people are going to be creating things that are going to take their market and business away from them because they they are just the status quo. I agree. I think they're facing the trouble of they've just gotten so big that they're they're pulling all of these brands together and putting it under one label just to be a defensive move to be, avoid the government breakup. But I have to tell you, I know a lot of people that don't know that, you know, IG is Facebook and they're just like, ew, I didn't know that was part of Facebook. I want to get out of this. So believe it or not, not everybody's technically savvy and integrated at that level of depth there. But I see Facebook. I see Google struggling now, too. I think a lot of these giant tech giants are going to have to figure out how they position themselves and move forward. Uh, Facebook should probably take a look at what Amazon's doing. I, I would also just add, you know, from a branding standpoint, there's a very interesting thing happening here, which is that the parent, the original, the, the flagship brand isn't as cool or mm -hmm. isn't as sexy as some of the, you know, the sub brands in a sense. So this is all, all almost them saying, hey, guys, remember us, remember us. <laughs> We're still important. We're still relevant. And, and the reality is to much younger consumers, Facebook, right as a parent isn't that relevant yeah i think that's that's a great call it, it's literally it's, it's, it's like they're trying to make their brand saying hey remember us or this is this is from us and is it going to help or hurt and i'm sure there are some of the other brands the what's is it whatsapp yeah whatsapps of this world are probably not happy about sort of being brought in under the the parent um, umbrella and so yeah there's probably going to be some brand tension and some um some some dis dissension and desertion from people. Mm. But as I say, for me, what I like about it, it just feels like a, a really safe corporate, um, you know, m move. It doesn't feel like something that a, a brand which has got a vision and a mission for, for the next generation has got, um, I don't know, got in mind. That's for me. It just feels very, very and safe. It feels like the record companies from old, the networks from old. It just feels like the big conglomerate companies of old. It just feels like a very old school way of doing and thinking about things. And, and I know that we're going to move through this quickly, but I just want to add two other quick points, which is very interesting. And, and I think you guys, listeners, and you can decide whether, in fact, this is a good move for Facebook showing progressiveness or whether it isn't. But when you actually, uh, uh, and these are both mobile experiences that I've seen firsthand, when you actually open WhatsApp, it says WhatsApp by Facebook, but the, by, the Facebook logo is green to match the WhatsApp green. So that is a deviation of what brand standards and logos and guidelines would say. The other thing that's interesting is when you actually look at the Facebook logo in Messenger and, and, and then again in the mobile app, the, the, the logo is being animated and they're like, in this particular one, they were kind of Christmas lights or holiday lights being strung around it. And that is just a, you know, a, a cut and paste imitation of what Google's been doing. So we are seeing Facebook doing, you know, trying from a brand standpoint um, to adjust, to morph, to be maybe less rigid and ultimately to evolve. And as I said, you can reserve judgment whether in fact that's a, that's a good thing, whether it's a pro or a con. Well, this was the year that a lot of brands experimented with audio in terms of audio logos. MasterCard heralded, heralded the event of their audio logo this, um, I guess it was earlier this spring. Um, yeah, basically, voice devices have taken off, Lisa. I mean, everybody's using them. Everybody's got them. And now right. brands are trying to get into this space of saying, we need an audio logo, which sounds like a really forward thinking idea, except that we've really had jingles and little sound bites and like the Intel dong, you know, it's just like well, that's yeah, been around and, like, forever. Like NBC Universal. I mean, like all of these sounds, 
I honestly feel like this is the response to the audio explosion. I feel like with with uh, podcasts coming out and really people are discovering them for the first time, everybody and everyone is trying to push out as much content as they possibly can. So I think audio has become very key. I don't know about you or the listeners on this, you know, on the show, how they are consuming content. Uh, I am constantly taking my phone with me and I download almost every podcast I listen to in an audio format because I don't have time to download video everywhere. So I think it's super important that brands, you know, pay attention to not only the visual aspects of, of jingles going on, but the audio has really come back. So to me, really, this is an old, I feel like an old radio 80s play, but it's super intelligent to bring it back given the explosion of audio, not just, you know, podcasts, but books and everything else we're listening to. So uh, I think it's worth trying. Yeah. And you forgot to add the Beancast um, intro music. That that audio always you know, gets me excited and energized <laughs> alongside the NBCs <laughs> and, and Intel of this world. So the question uh, was kind of, the, the, is it the comeback and MasterCard? I actually listened to it and I thought, oh, this is interesting. So yeah. if, it, if it can make your brand just a little bit more interesting, a little bit more re- memorable, a little bit more revel- uh, relevant and a little bit more differentiated in a meaningful way, I think that's actually quite smart because ultimately if you want to you want to catch you that catchy sort of three or four seconds, like the McDonald's one, I'm, I'm loving it. I won't sing it. I think that that's just part of great fundamental marketing. And so the fact that they're doing it in 2019 is saying, hey, you know, you're 30 years behind how others have done it. But now I'm sure there's going to be a lot of other brands and companies scrambling to get their audio jingle. And um, it's going to be good for the creatives out there who are coming up with with that with that you know that device but i think it's good from just again from a human center perspective using all the senses makes so much sense so kudos to mastercard for trying to raise the bar i mean i think uh, i'm going to take maybe a little contrarian position no joe you never do that exactly exactly but uh and all i think all the audio people are going to probably kill me for saying this but you know i think all of these little you know moves to kind of get these uh audio jingles or, or these these um these kind of, you know, these logo or reminder devices, I think it's all desperation tactics because, you know, the reality is, is that these are all people, whether it's radio, whether it's television, um, the only way to get someone's attention today um, is is to be able to kind of pull out all the stops. And the reality is most people, for example, when they're watching television, they're on their mobile phones, they are multitasking, they've got multiple screens. And so, you know, whether it's the Honda jingle or ding or, or dong or whatever the hell we're calling it or, or the Toyota one, I think, you know, it, it, it is at least an effort to say, again, like kind of, hey, this is a Honda commercial. Do you want to pay attention? And sadly, the reality is for the most part, no, we don't. I think that's the most important thing about these audio logos and why they've become such a trendy thing is because of the divided attention. We are watch TV while we're surfing our phones or our computers or our iPads and you know that 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 sound bite, that little sound that recogni- that's recognizable as part of the brand, does get our attention and makes us yeah. pay pay closer. You know, give more yeah, mind I, share to what's going on on the screen. That's most important to us. I, I think, think brands just... have to do this. You know, they don't really have a choice. They have to keep trying things. Experiential advertising's coming out. Audio jingles are coming out. People are trying to grab your attention because we're so fragmented on how we consume content these days. So they're going to try everything they possibly can to get in front of you and grab. Maybe this will grab you, Bob, and but maybe it won't grab Sam. I, I think you're building on that. I think there is this reassurance because I've been you know, last few days, I've been watching a lot of Netflix. And there is that, if, I don't know, it just feels good. It feels reassured. It feels like something I've chosen. So there is so, probably a lot of psychology about it. But when I hear the Netflix um, sound, or I think, is, does Amazon Prime have one? I can't think if it does or doesn't. Prime, but that sound Prime does. From, yeah. And so it just, it, it kind of reminds you where you are and what you're doing. Because now if I'm confused between Netflix Prime and, and, and major, you know, just, hey, this is where you are. Oh, cool. I'm happy about it versus uh, this sucks. So I, I, I think it's just a very human thing. And we'll, let's see how it plays out. As I say, for me, it's there's going to be some some beef, some controversy and people accused of stealing other people's jingles and sounds. But, you know, I, I love the fact that the good old days of radio and audio and, and, and you know, copy and music and signature t- tunes and those things are going to come back because that that kind of it, those are those are great 
those are great memories. So I think it's just how do you link this kind of stuff to memories and sort of the psychological cues that we all live as human beings? I kind of like it. So I'm happy. Thank you for well, making this a thing. Speaking of Amazon, we th- just when you thought the whole Amazon HQ fiasco was all settled and we knew where the headquarters were going to be, this was the year that Amazon, after awarding one half of their headquarters to New York City, pulled out of New York City. This was such a fiasco, Joe. I mean, I, I, I don't even know where to begin with this. I mean, there's union busting involved with this. There's money involved with this. There's politics involved with this. There's um, communities rising up against them in the process here. There's so many angles in this story. Um, it didn't damage Amazon a bit, did it? I mean, it, it didn't, and it was... There, there were all these, like, sub-stories. I mean, this really in a way, became uh, a story about uh, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez. Um, you know, it became uh, the, 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 the rise of the powerful, um, you know, millennial uh, politician. That was almost like a side story. Um, there, were, there was also a power struggle within, you know, within New York. You had, you know, you had, uh, and this is true, guys, that, you know, New York Governor Andrew Cuomo uh, said that he would change his name to Amazon Cuomo um, if if Amazon actually gave you know and awarded the the headquarters to New York. Um, so I don't I guess he didn't have to do that because it was withdrawn. Um, so I mean you know depending on what side of the fence you you you, you know you sit, um, you know who was the big loser here? I don't think it was Amazon. It may have been New York State. Um, what I do find interesting is for someone that really I think we all probably focused a lot on it. I don't actually know where it went in the end. So it almost seemed like the story just disappeared after after they pulled out of oh, New York. Does anyone it, know where they ended up it, settling? It, it didn't go anywhere. They had the Vienna, Virginia half of the HQ, which I assume took up all the HQ in for, terms of their East Coast HQ at this point. So I, I don't... And I, and, I, and I do want to just say one thing, because when you talk about did Amazon suffer, Amazon turned it into a game where basically all of these states were falling over each other for the privilege, the right, the honor of being able to host Amazon. I think we covered Imagine this on all of the publicity they got Amazon from. It. I think we Joe. covered this on last year's show about the fact that it was all big data scam. They tried. Well, to no, get a this is a reality on. TV show. Yeah. This, this could be a new, a new, a new thing, and I think we just created it. So let's get some producers and studio execs and create the show where we're going to bring this company. Will it be Google? Will it be Facebook? Or will it be Amazon? Find out. You know, like the the what's the one with the singers and the, and they're all in costumes with different animals. And things. <laughs> we need a new thing, and, we, and we're going to get. Uh, this is big. The Aud- audience Google. and listeners, we you heard it here first. You know, I don't disagree, but I still think New York was the biggest loser in this deal. Um, you know, so what if they rented a few offices at the Hudson Yard? Um, everyone's like, ooh, look, they're doing that. And it's like, yeah, they're just consolidating what they already had there. Uh, I think it's sad what, how much they demand, but I really feel New York lost out by not getting it. Mm. Well, crowdfunding was big in the news earlier on this year. Um, people were saying crowdfunding is back. We're getting into more crowdfunding campaigns. A lot of startups are looking at crowdfunding. And then we ended the year with a huge fiasco because Unicorn, which was a scooter manufacturer, with a $699 scooter that was taking pre-orders, never delivered a single scooter and went out of business as a result of this. Um, I'm not sure, Sam, what to think about crowdfunding anymore. Uh, you know, it was it was hot again at the beginning of the year, like I mentioned, but now I'm starting to go, there's no way that I would invest in a crowdfunding operation at this point. Well, firstly, I'd like to say that I don't know what Saturday Night Live are going to write about. You know, they create those those um, sort of spoof ads during the, the show about, like, you know, this unicorn scooter company. You could pay $500 and you're laughing off your sofa. And actually, it wasn't a spoof. This was a real story. So they're going to ha- they're, they're running out of content. But in, in, in all seriousness, I think crowdfunding, what it does, it does democratize the ability to 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 bring something to market and that concept of peer to peer of other people backing real real people's ideas is such a great idea the problem comes when you have these cases where you have um, you know perhaps hero um, founders kind of um, building off their credit their their name to to come up with something and when i was reading some of this it, it was like oh no we spent so much money on facebook ads we couldn't make the product it was like huh what what that is like huh 
I was, it, it, who, what were you thinking? What were you doing? You weren't focused on making it. You were focused on advertising and promoting it, which is the marketing school book, schoolboy era of all time. So for me, I, I know it's going to make people skeptical of, of crowdfunding. So I'm, I'm hoping some of these platforms actually make sure they do protect investors. And I think a lot of them do. But how do you protect the investors and the funders so that you, this can be done on ongoing because I think crowd it's like for me a lot of musicians have used these types of platforms and I love when an artist wants to like you know make a record make an album and the fans and the supporters help fund it to bring it to market so those and kind of things are a great example it seems so only I'm five years it. it seems only like five years ago uh, I was walking around the toy fair which comes up in New York every year and almost every single little company that was trying to launch some new fantastic cool toy was doing a crowdfunding campaign and now over the last couple of years, I've walked around and nobody's doing any crowdfunding. Um, I'm not sure whether or not this was just a whole bunch of hype at the beginning of the year that crowdfunding was back because I, I just don't see it as being a viable solution for any kind of company that's legitimately looking for long-term growth and not just looking to launch one product without any kind of business strategy. And, yeah, and what I'm kind of with Bob. <laughs> <laughs> I've done too, I've done too many early stuff and we've bought scooters and they fell apart and after doing too many um you know crowdfunding projects and having bought into a few I would say only about 1 out of 10 actually happened so it's a pass for me until they can improve it and and whatever happened to the I think it was called the jobs act and and the fact that that you know crowdfunding should have uh you know been about equity about actually buying into the company and sharing in the spoils of the company. So what it really just became was a way to, you know, get product, early product, pre-release product. And that isn't, that's the tip of the tip of the iceberg. So I remain and always have been very bullish on crowd everything, wisdom of crowds, crowdfunding, mm -hmm. crowd sharing. Mm -hmm. the, the, the issue is, you know, that of course, you know, it is our human nature as working professionals to basically stuff up everything through greed and cluelessness and laziness. And so, you know, is it back to your point? Maybe not, maybe not the second coming, but certainly, you know, when are we going to actually see real equity and people being able to buy into and help fund these companies? You know, that's I, what it is. It's crowdfunding, crowdfunding, but not I, getting I, product. I, I do want to get deep and, and serious now. One of the things that this, this, this approach does is it does allow people from minority groups from disenfranchised communities to actually have access to funding because the problem with traditionally funding innovations and entrepreneurs it's the same old same old people you know the few white guys at the top who don't who aren't necessarily connected to the communities and the audiences who are trying to change markets or trying to ch um, appeal or provide for communities who are underserved or under marketed to or underrepresented so the construct i think is great so yes let's put some potentially some protections or considerations but my nervousness to, is to say it's bad is well if you look at some of the failures these aren't the um these are people perhaps who should, well these definitely in, in the one that we were talking about the unicorn they should know better they you know if you're so i'm just nervous that the the skepticism or cynicism about the whole um platform or the whole approach will again disenfranchise and and hinder people who don't have access to the traditional routes of financing and you know just speaking personally i know my wife and i we used prosper and other and a couple of other peer-to-peer -peer lending groups when we started our own business because every bank said this is the best business plan we've ever seen but we won't lend it to you and if you're a black female entrepreneur that you kind of hear that quite often so that's just my watch out on a serious note um to, to the audience and um, to this panel well, speaking of access and opportunity, um, 5G is supposed to democratize the Internet and make it more available, faster, better, stronger, supposed to give us the opportunity to connect one time and be connected to that same account no matter where we go, no matter where we roam. Lisa, 5G has been promised to be amazing things. Now we're starting to see the rollout of it. Um, what's 2020 going to look like when it comes to 5G? Is this going to be the year of 5G? Or are we still four to five years out before we actually see the benefits of such a distributed, awesome, cool, always connected world? 
Well, I, I kind of think it's four to five years out based on the expense. I mean, where is it? It's nowhere. Okay, who cares if it's in the corner of 13 NFL stadiums? Because I did look that up going, <laughs> where is 5G? You know, I, I, I live in California and, and my internet's not great either. So it's like, I don't, I, I think saying that it's going to roll out next year is really, uh, it's, it's too soon. I think the cost and the expense of it, not only do you have to have the right devices to actually get it there, but just the how expensive it is to put it in. I, I think it's four to five years out here in the U.S. at least. I mean, that's just my prediction. Yeah, I just, I'm just thinking, remember those portable TVs that never worked or the first days of the iPhone when you couldn't, was it cut or copy and paste? And so it's going to be a while before it works well. But if it's anything better than the current system, please, I can't wait two and a half seconds for this ad or this, this you know, the content to download. I want everything fast and instantaneous and I want it to work, damn it. So please well, from make the, 5G better. You know, you go into a restaurant and the first thing you ask is, do you have Wi-Fi? And they're like, because if they don't, what are you going to, you know, I, I can't be um, without signal for like 30, 40 <laughs> seconds in my life. So um, I actually leave restaurants if they don't have Wi-Fi. <laughs> Well, exactly. what, you know, what people, if, no, I wasn't being facetious. People do that. If you look, if you listen carefully, when the first thing they don't say what's the menu or the food, they literally ask, "Do you have Wi-Fi?" And if if the answer is no, they leave. That is the criteria for every cafe and restaurant these days. So, in all seriousness, I think the technology is going to improve, and we're looking forward to the good of it. I think we just haven't figured out where, what the bad and the downsides are. But from everything I've heard about 5G and its connectivity and its stability and the way it just works versus things like Wi-Fi that we're kind of used to, it's a superior and better technology. So I think a lot of the companies are overclaiming right now as to what it does and how it will work. But I, I'm, I'm excited for the future in terms of the next three or four years, we're actually going to get some of those benefits. And where, and basically, we're now going to move to that society where everything's connected, everything's got a chip in it. And data privacy is something we're going to have to get over because we're always on, always connected, always being tracked. And, and always, for um, me, that's the, that's the bigger story here. It's not about access. It's not about speed. It's about the fact that we're always on with a device and then it becomes a trackable device. And it also changes the dynamic of who has our location data. Um, up till now, it's been up to the apps to have like kind of a bottleneck on their user data and the interactions of the users via their apps and via the phone device. But now it becomes if your one device, your one connection is always going through the same phone company that's providing the 5G signal, suddenly there's a bottleneck on all of our information that's going through one source. And that person or that one company has more control and more opportunity um, it's both really cool from a marketing standpoint, but it's also very challenging from a marketing standpoint because now we have this this one vendor who has all the power. It's kind yeah. of yeah. There was there was that article um, time recording sort of end of twenty nineteen New York Times when you, if you read that you'll be very very scared where they were just showing how, you know all the pings and just just how you're being tracked today. So if you think about where we are today, it's only going to get worse. What my only hope, which is a hope, is that knowing what we know now, the legislators need to get their fingers out and start, you know, make this the number one legislative priority. I'm sure the Europeans are at it already, but let's get the rules in place and start thinking about the future versus waiting till 10, 15 years down the line when, you know, everything's gone um, down the toilet. So I think there is a not only is a technology something we should consider, but what are the rules of the game and how are we going to play? Because you're right, Bob, if we know the phone companies are selling our data, using our data without us knowing it right now, because they're, they're tracking us already, what's going to happen in the next five, 10 years? What are those rules? We don't know. And I don't think they're clear. So let's get them in place. And that's my plea for all the legislators and politicians listening to the show. Well, it's an interesting topic. And we're going to a lot more to cover a lot more of these amazing stories that we covered over the last year but first we've got to do lisa's ad so we got to make some time for her this is super important so make some time for me bob <laughs> it is that time of year you know uh, people are out there planning for their 2020 media strategies they're looking for solid new audiences with lots of disposable cash well i've got an opportunity to connect you with what is i'm just going to say it the most responsive and lucrative technology-minded audience out there bar none our sponsor is Artisanal Agency, and they are the exclusive representative for Twit.tv, the This Week in Tech podcasting network. Now, there are a lot of great shows on Twit. We're talking about shows like MacBreak Weekly, a seminal podcast on the Mac world, iOS Today, a new player that's giving great insight into the iOS device realm. 
uh, Windows Weekly, um, This Week in Tech, of course, the big granddaddy of the shows. And that's just four of their many amazing programs, all of which, and I emphasize this, all of which are generating phenomenal results for sponsors. Now, listen to these numbers, uh, 50 million downloads a year. 70% of that audience directly works in tech, and 82% of them say that they have bought a product directly as the result of a twit.tv ad recommendation. These are impressive statistics about a responsive audience that is actually buying things. And remember, the, these hosts who are on the twit.tv network are offering what is, a, what is an actual live read recommendation. Uh, they take that responsibility extremely seriously. Not just anyone can advertise on Twit. Uh, artisanal agency will vet you. They'll make sure that each sponsor is carefully vetted so that their hosts can actually offer you a brand, your brand, a genuine recommendation that is heartfelt and is completely legitimate and is com completely honest uh, in terms of how they feel about your product. And at the same time, you can relax knowing that there won't be any brand safety issues playing in the background. Everybody's vetted, so you know you're running with good company whenever you're on their network. And it doesn't matter whether you're coming in with a completely baked campaign or need everything from graphics to ad copy help. Artisanal Agency makes it easy for you either way. They ensure your campaigns run seamlessly from onboarding hosts to delivering creative assets to monitoring your ad reads. Now reach out today to start your campaign on the twit.tv network. Visit artisanalagency.com to find out more or email them at hello at artisanalagency.com. That's hello at artisanalagency.com. Start your next podcast ad campaign with a show from Twit, and we thank them very much for their support of the Beancast. Well, moving back to our list Instagram finally makes shoppable images into a must-do marketing tactic. Joe, this is the year of Instagram. Um, we've talked about Instagram ads working in the past. Over the last couple of years, they've grown more and more popular. But this is the year where it seems like everybody has bought something from an Instagram ad. They are phenomenal. And it's changing the way we're looking at uh, advertising and marketing of DTC products. Um, looking at it as more of an opportunity to make social selling and uh, shoppable images and a, a key part of our strategy. Hey, there is no question. And, uh, you know, it's, it's actually a standing joke in my household because every other day some package arrives, uh, you know, imported from China. And, uh, you know, and everyone just rolls their eyes and goes, basically, dad's been on Instagram again. <laughs> um, I, can't, I can't resist. And by the way, oh, none I of them actually, None of them work, but that's another story oh, okay. for another day. But 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 actually, it, it's so much more interesting, you know, than just the shop now, buy now. Um, it is the shoppable, uh, you know, multiple, you know, hotspots on one image that is just taking it to the next level. And and obviously, you know, Bob, we uh, we have Lynn Power in in common, uh, you know, who's my my partner at the HMS Beagle. One of our clients and one of our products is this is a Japanese hair care product called Masami, and uh, Masami has now launched. It's soft launch, and uh, and I actually was in my own Instagram feed looking at 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 something from Masami and just saying like, oh my god, it's the first time I'd ever actually seen a shoppable ad. It's so cool to be able to click on three or four different products in the same square and be able to check out directly and and it is it, you know it shouldn't be revolutionary because it just seems like it's been coming for so long you know we've been talking about it in context of television but now that it's in this you know instagram frame or container but the reality is of course instagram is a commerce is a is the little commerce powerhouse that could and it's it's incredible yeah, that's why I, I have this love-hate re relationship with Instagram. And look, I've got my first problem is when I say this ad is not relevant, why the hell do you keep showing it to me? When I see it too often, why do you keep showing it, showing me more of it? So that's my first complaint. You know, they after an ad, you, you're supposed to, you, you have a choice to click one of those three buttons. I swear that doesn't do anything, and it, it makes you sell more. So, yes, I'm a bit of a Grinch because I'm, I'm fighting 
um, inst- places like Instagram being for commerce and not, uh, being for communication and entertainment. And I constantly fighting, fighting. It, what's the right thing to do? But obviously, I can't stop the tide, and it's going to go in that direction. And so, the the shoppable. I, I mean, you know, for me, I think if if the the creative and the content does a great job for where you have passions, if if the personalization works. And so I'm, you know, I'm a Prince fan. So if if you told me about the new book, uh, or if you gave me a, like a Prince experience, and there was songs, there was merchandise, there was content there that I could immerse in and I could buy then and there. Thank you for that. I'll take my money. Here's here's my, here's my credit card willingly. I think that the problem is there's just lots of crap and lots of bad ads out there and lots of bad experiences. So for me, and um, the the pla- these platforms have to be vested in raising the bar and making the, exper- the experiences good because. You, you talked about your that Japanese hair care product, but a lot of the Insta Insta stuff I'm seeing is just completely irrelevant. It's turning me off the platform more than it is solving a problem or meeting my needs or giving me more of what I want from my perspective. And, is and, and I know, one second, I was, is, one I was, second. Is, is Instagram the only player in this space? I mean, it, it seems to me like the, the early leader was always Pinterest. People talked about Pinterest being very shoppable, but mm-hmm. it seems like Pinterest has been left in the dust Instagram has taken over. You've got um, minor plays going over on Snapchat and TikTok's experimenting with this space as well. I mean, Lisa, is Instagram the only player in town really that's being effective in terms of the shoppable image or are other players kind of on the background about the leap forward? Um, I think there are other players, but I agree that, you know, IG has made the lead. At least it was the one I shopped the most. And I also agree on the frustration because Instagram has always been my favorite social media app, except for now I feel like I have way too many ads. Before it was an ad every 12 or 13 pictures. Now I feel like I'm getting an ad every three to four pictures. So I don't mind them adding like little tags. Like if I see something and I like it and I want to shop it, that's fine. But overall, the number of impressions of ads that have been delivered on IG at this point has made me stop going to that app when I want to when I want to peruse my social media app. I'm starting to go to Twitter more and a couple of other programs, which it's kind of depressing for me. So I wish they would pull back on the number of ads that they're throwing out there <laughs> and and how much I'm seeing because I, I'm starting to not use this app. So I'm I'm really looking forward to the next big thing. I'm not a Pinterest person. I know that's mostly like a female dominated uh, app. I've never really used it that much. I like Instagram because I can follow photographers. I can follow a lot of different people, but I'm just really getting overwhelmed with too many ads. So I, I think they're making a huge mistake allowing, you know, oh, this is working. So let's do more of what's working instead of just going, this is working. Let's maintain this because we can grow by adding people instead of by adding ads. I, I was just going to add, I mean, I think Pinterest has probably been a leader uh, for years and years now, but they certainly aren't as in vogue and, and visible and, and relevant uh, at least from a mainstream standpoint as Instagram, they still tend to be a little bit more niche. The, the other thing is, I know we're going to talk about the uh, about cookies, um, but the other thing that, that Instagram is doing uh, incredibly well and yet uh, awfully uh, is the fact that you go on to, you know, hypothetically, you know, hotel tonight on, the, on a website, and the next thing you know, you've got a nice little sponsored ad on Instagram for hotels in San Francisco. And, you know, this is nothing new to anyone who's been in the digital space for 15, 20 years. Um, but it's it's kind of, you know, eerie and and inevitably and inevitable that we're now seeing it. And the seamlessness and, and how this is happening in real time, um, you know, it, it, it's scary good and well, it's, scary it's, bad. Yeah, it's scary bad because yeah, I, turn, I turn off my microphone Uh, on most of my apps now or if not all of them because there's been too many cases where you know you've been talking about some obscure thing and all of a sudden you get served up ads within 24 hours and the more journalists do the expose the more they show that yeah there is they you've signed off your rights for them to listen in and sell you stuff even though you don't think you've done that my biggest issue with all of these is become clean so i think we started off talking about shoppable ads but there there is a murkiness growing and someone's making a lot of the money and i think these platforms should be vested in raising the bar being forces for good and being transparent and for me 
this is only good if the, the more transparent they are. And, you know, and I don't, you know, again, if you look at who's running these companies and who they're taking advice from and how they're behaving, especially when it comes to political ads, I'm not sure they're actually going to come good and do the right thing. It saddens me to say that, but right now they're kind of being forces for making as much money as possible and ext extracting as much from consumers as possible. And hopefully it'll be their downfall, but um, I don't know. I think they're winning right now. Well, for several years now, one of the boogeymen out there in advertising has been the management consultancy. They've been marching into the agency services space, uh, leading all kinds of problems, leading to all kinds of problems for the agency world. And now Accenture, Joe, bought a controlling stake in Droga 5 this past year. Um, so they are fully invested in the agency world, taking one of the best shops on board as one of their own. Um just got to wonder what the future is on the on the landscape as a result of this move. Will we see the management consultancies start buying up the holding companies or is this something that is just a one off move where they're buying one agency to experiment and see whether or not they can um, integrate that kind of service into their offering as a whole? I mean, I feel that, you know, this is a great topic. And of course, it's very relevant in terms of, you know, what's been happening this year for a year end show, um, because it has been, um, you know, a continuation of, of this, um, you know, even when Sir Martin Sorrell was at the helm at WPP, lamenting the fact that they were getting their lunch stolen, uh, you know, they're on both sides by the Facebooks and Googles, the frenemies, the tech companies, and then the management consultancies on the other side. And the question posed, even I think when I was on the show or, or, or when you discussed it on the show, was well, which was which is going to happen first? Will will the the holding companies and the agencies bring in management consulting type strategic and business services? Which will happen first, that or the management consultancies bringing in production and creative uh, capabilities? And 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 clearly. You know, there, there is, it's not even close that round one in this boxing match, in this death match, has gone to the management consultancies, the Deloitte's, the KPMG's, the PWC's, the Accenture's, buying up these these creative agencies. I think what why this was so relevant is Droga 5 really was uh, a high, it wasn't like heat being acquired. I think it was heat by Deloitte. This is a big deal, you know, to look at Droga um, becoming part of a management consultancy. I, I will say one thing, which is it seems like the last half of the year, or at least the last three or four months, we haven't seen as much of this conversation or heard as much of this conversation like the Amazon HQ conversation. But but I think really what's been happening is, you know, the management consultancies don't have to make bold moves because basically the, the holding companies are imploding perfectly well by themselves. Um, and, and, and that's really the, the reality. I mean, we look at, you know, um, Lynn's old stomping ground, J. Walter Thompson, JWT becoming Wonderman Thompson, whatever the hell they're called today. You know, it, it just seems right now um, the holding companies have got much bigger fish to fry. And so the management consultancies, whether this was the right move for the right reasons or for earned media, uh, they probably are sitting pretty right now. Well, when, when, is the, when are they going to overstep their bounds uh, in terms of the brand relationship? Because they're, they're getting involved with every part of the advertising relationship, the business relationship with their clients, right down to even leading agency pitches. I mean, they, they've got agency services on board. They're doing the business consulting. Now they're also leading pitches. Um, and WPP has even put a ban on participating in any kind of pitch led by a management consultancy. And I, I don't blame them. I mean, it's so incestuous, the kind of relationship they're putting together here. Um, I'm wondering when the brands wake up and say, what do you mean you're leading our pitch and your own agency wins the pitch? I mean, that doesn't make any sense. You know, you're recommending yourself. Uh, it, there's how do yeah, you, you firewall you've, you've that? Hit a, you've, you've hit the nail on the head there, I think. So I have to be in full disclosure. I'm a marketing transformation consultant and I work with a marketing transformation consultancy. And what's now becoming more apparent is exactly what you described that there was a bit of um, the, there was a lack of transparency in the whole processes going on. So if you are a marketing consultant, I spend a lot of my time marketing capabilities, marketing strategy, and I'm trying to solve a business challenge, a marketing challenge. And 
it's not vested on a single agency or a single solution. You're trying to solve the problem in the right way. And you do need that transparency. And what's in it for me, I'm going to give you the best advice. And I'm agnostic to any technology, any agency, any, any solution. And I think it behooves the brands and the CMOs and the CEOs to actually understand what they are doing and what they're asking for and who they're playing with. And I just don't think a lot of them do. So they are, a lot of marketers do not know that some of the records they're, they're getting is because the agency is winning if they choose a particular vendor or a particular platform or technology. So if you want, to, if solving the problem means rampant transparency, being completely open and acting in the best interests of the business challenge and, and just, you know, just being transparent and telling the truth. And I think it behooves the brands, the, the client side people to actually ask the right questions, be properly informed and make the right decisions. And so for me, that's one consideration. But overall, I think it's great that consult people who are more broad based consultants are trying to solve business challenges, which could result in creative solves. It could result in process solves. It could result in technology solves. It could result in capability solves. So that you're, you've got an armory, a toolkit to solve a business challenge. And if I go back a few years as a marketer, I was flabbergasted that the big four consultancies we'd, we would always get the gig of solving a business challenge, but they wouldn't actually be able to to um, double click into well how are you going to bring this to life how are you going to drive the change management through the organization so they they were paid to building the deck but not solving the problem so the fact that there are creative solves technology solves digital solves capability solves within their armory i think is a good thing for actually solving client needs but also but only if there is rampant and, and flagrant transparency in the processes and i don't think i think that's the issue right now because people just don't know that there are affiliations and associations on the current recommendations or the current agencies they're working with. Well, well uh, another big story from this year was that the cookie was supposed to die, finally. Uh, we're talking about that little file that follows you around in your web browser, telling you where, telling marketers where you've been and what you're doing. Um, Lisa, this was supposed to be gone this year. We were supposed to be having to market in a much more smart fashion, having to look at consumer taxonomies as a replacement. Yet it seems like cookie files are doing well and good and that there's no real immediate need to end your cookie strategy. Uh, am I wrong on that? Uh, no, I think they've actually increased on that. I mean, just being on the other side in the podcast world, people are reaching out to me. They want me to start putting pixels in my feeds so that they can then marry the information of people that are downloading our content and listening to our shows to people signing up for the clients that were in those shows. So I don't see the cookie going away anytime soon. I see that tracking's actually increasing and going the opposite way and getting consumer taxonomy. Yeah, right. That's not really going to work. I mean, I do, uh, to be honest with you, we do a survey every year. We get over 25,000 responses to our survey, and that's not enough for brands. Brands want more information, more tracking pixels, more cookies. So I don't really see this going away. I see this honestly just increasing. Of course, we're going to have disclosures, and does anybody really read a term of service or, or anything along those lines? So the reality is I don't see this going away. I just see this constantly increasing. And, you know, I'd love to hear what Joe and Sam have to say about it, but that's just my opinion. After you, Joe. <laughs> do either of you want to comment on it, or do you not? <laughs> no, I mean, no, I, 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 you I, go, you go. I was, no, I, I'm going to go because, like, for me, this is I get I then I then sort of empathize with the marketing. I'm just thinking, if you're listening to this show and you're you're a marketer trying to do your job, you think, oh, come on, please stop making my life harder for me and all these. Um, you know, br browsers, uh, it's basically pr preventing cookies from working. And how am I going to get this information? How, gonna, how am I going to explain that my marketing's working? How am I going to sell more product? How am I going to create the right things for the consumers to be relevant? So it, it's getting harder and harder and harder. So uh, it, the, the industry is getting more complicated. The work is getting harder. So I just have huge empathy. If as a marketer right now, you might want to go and become a fire person or go and work in a different industry because it's getting so hard and complicated. But equally, I think you, you can be optimistic and think, OK, how am I going to do this? And for me, I, I mentioned the example of print and music. It works well. You can you can make it work if, if you personalize and get to me and you have my permission. I'm just thinking of brands like Spotify, where I'm glad you have my data. Sell, solve me, serve me up. Um, concerts and tickets for events that I'd love or new albums or new content or uh, from bands that I love. So where I have passion, where I have needs that are clearly declared, I think there are ways to use my information to use the, t um, the technology and get to me 
in a relevant way and also have my permission to so where i have passions and things i love give me more of what i want i think you've got to figure out what that is and who that audience is and do that homework um from a from a marketing and brand perspective but as i say right now on, the, on this topic i'm just thinking if i'm a marketer i don't know what to do or who to believe because all of this is making my life harder over to you now joe I was just going to, you know, almost add that that there's a parallel story here, which, and I think you kind of uh, picked up a little bit on it uh, uh, there uh, in what you said, which is, you know, the rise of first, or the importance of first party data, um, because when you start thinking of um, of privacy, you know, GDPR of the, you know, I mean, it, it, it's there, there's no question um, that marketers and brands before they change profession, if they want to stay in the game. They're going to have to think about how to really kind of, you know, go direct, right? Direct to consumer. Um, and that might actually give them a little bit of an insurance policy. Um, but certainly when we continue to look at where this trend is going um, and, and, you know, we do, you know, with disclosure, we do quite a bit of work with, with ad tech and, uh, and some more tech companies, but specifically in the ad tech space, you know, whether it's native, whether it's programmatic, whether it's the whole DCO space, um, these are very relevant. I mean, these are very um uh, you know, important conversations to right. have right now. And so we'll see what happens. Yeah. And, and, you know, for me, what's frightening and truly frightening, I've, I've spoken to too many presidents and senior leaders and organizations who say, no, we don't want first party data. And, and I'm thinking, no, that's the wrong, that's the wrong. It's how to do it. It should be working. I'm not saying we're not going to do it. So I just think a lot of companies and organizations are seeding ground and they're going to be irrelevant. So if you're not in the business of wanting to do stuff with first party data or not getting or understanding it, please get yourself informed. Please come into 2020 and learn what modern marketing is, because if you're not in the game of first party data, you're, you're screwed. Well, this is the year that product reviews became the absolute essential device in any kind of marketing campaign. Um, I know that product reviews have for a long time driven uh, much of the e-commerce world. Uh, why is this year any different from previous years, Joe? I mean, why is it this year that we were paying attention to product reviews as some kind of we need to have it? I don't know. You tell me. I mean, we've been we've been talking about product reviews since... <laughs> since since the dawn of digital um so I, I don't know the answer in terms of why you know why this year i mean i think uh, at the end of the you know if, if you had to surmise or if you had to kind of um try and, and 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 stretch for an idea it would be the fact that that clutter and confusion and noise um you know we've just spoken about the uh, even with the crowdfunding story about the fact that not every not every product can stand on its own two feet and so but, but I think it's a content play as well. You know, at the end of the day, um, it's less about the review and the rating. I mean, this comes back to what I wrote about in Flip the Funnel. Um, the credibility, uh, the independence, the influence, uh, the authenticity of a customer-driven um, review now more than ever, as opposed to putting real customers in ads um, and, uh, and recognizing the, the, that this is as much a content play as it is an advocacy uh, and an authenticity play. So, you know, I, I would just say to that, it's about time because, you know, I think we, I don't think there's anybody on this show today or even listening that, that would, you know, would, would push back on this. We'd all say the same thing. It's about time. Yeah. yeah and I, oh, I, 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 I okay. no, go ahead. Oh, I just think it's the explosion of products, too, that have come out. I mean, if you t if you take a look around, how many home security systems are there available? How many Wi-Fi mesh networks could you look right. at? How many possible phone reviews can you look at? So for me, I'm always looking at product reviews. And now you have the ability on Amazon where, you know, they've set up an association program where you can upload your, your content. So being a tech network, we have content. We can upload reviews to the Amazon site so people can see them. Oh, hey, this is coming from an independent reviewer of a tech network that has tech journalists, you know, doing the actual review that you can actually go and take a look at the review. So frankly, I rely heavily on customer reviews for everything. I mean, it's not just for, you know, products, it's for services. I was, you know, getting a gift certificate for a girlfriend. I wanted to buy her a spa package. What did I do? I looked at all the reviews of like eight different places and then picked the best one based on independent customer reviews. And I really feel with the onslaught of data that's out there, all the different things we have to take a look at, why aren't customer reviews relevant? I think 
think this year people really have understood that with all the choices and everything around there, people want to actually read something on it. So I think this is going to continue. People are going to want to see customer reviews, not the company putting a review out. Um, I just think this is going to continue moving forward into 2020 and beyond. Yeah, and there is a driver behind this. If you look at the trust um, in professions sort of data and reviews, it shows that unfortunately politicians, government officials and ad people are at the bottom of the scale in terms of single digit in terms of trust and and other professions are so much higher. So mark, branding, marketing and advertising isn't being trusted. And so people are going to use reviews to make decisions. And it's interesting to me that some of these platforms like the TripAdvisor and Open Tables and all these these um, sites where you do get reviews aren't profitable. I'm, I think they're still struggling to make money because there is this lack of credibility and trust in the advertisers and more but wanting to find other sources of truth, uh, yet equally, if you think about influencers who are now just like advertisers, the FTC and other people cracking down on them because influencers are also n losing trust. So I don't think this is not new because, you know, we used to we used to talk over the garden fence back in the good old days and get, um, you know, referrals and references and um, ideas from friends. Now we just do it with thumbs instead of over the, you know, with on, on Twitter and, and these various things. So it's, it's not a new behavior. It's perhaps more important in the age where fake news and the lack of trust in general is forcing us to look elsewhere for this information and reviews could be the way to do that. So if we can ensure that the reviews have integrity and they are real people, they're not algorithms and, and bots, there's going to be growth in that because for the next few years, we're not going to trust, unfortunately, um, the message from a lot of the people who are giving us from the brand and the advertising side. For the fa now, another big story this past year. For the last forty-eight months, we've talked about Disney's media dominance as they went and bought Fox and started to get a controlling interest in a whole bunch of different properties. And then, seemingly out of the blue, uh, Sam. I mean, it just came seemingly out of the blue. They suddenly owned all of Hulu. They had a controlling interest in Hulu with NBC bowing out their management control and seeding. Um, all the remaining shares of Hulu to Disney. Disney now owns Hulu. Um, now they have Disney Plus. They have, Di they have Hulu. They have the Marvel catalog. They have the Star Wars catalog. Disney's dominance is absolutely unshakable now. Um, Hooray! Does this mean more Baby Yoda? Because yeah. if this means more Baby Yoda everywhere, <laughs> then we're all winning, right? Because that's all I can think about. When I saw this story and I knew we were going to cover it, that's what... Okay, can I just say that was the biggest... I didn't put this in the fail because we were only covering past fails. But for me, the biggest fail of this entire holiday season was the fact that they weren't ready with Baby Yoda well, dolls yeah, for the stores. Yeah, but just because they, cut, they, they hit the zeitgeist doesn't mean they were ready with the stuffed toy to co commercialize and capitalize on it. Oh, come so on. Like, you proved, couldn't look at Baby it, Yoda and know that this was going to be a hot toy to sell they, in the Well, clearly, Bob, they didn't. Clearly, Bob, they didn't. So that's what brings me joy is like, really? you got the hottest thing in the year and you can't buy one for Christmas because adults, children, old and young, everyone around the world would die for, for multiple baby Yodas. But I don't think that was a question. But in, in all seriousness, <laughs> I think baby Yoda is the new Mickey Mouse. And what brings me joy, for, if you're a Disney, if you're a creative, if you're a creator, if you're that kind of person, I think there's a great story that a company which was founded on this mission of and, and what it stood for and this frivolousness, this storytelling, this creativity has managed to reinvent, reinvent, reinvent to become a behemoth. But as I say, they're bringing you Baby Yoda. They're bringing you superheroes and characters from comic books from the 50s and 60s. They're, they are driving culture. They are parts of culture. They are, yes, they are kind of becoming as a, a media conglomerate. But if you, for me, it's just a fascinating story. If you saw Marvel 10, 15, you know, about to go bankrupt, irrelevant to becoming the most relevant. And I always think superheroes, it's funny because you know like someone like spider-man is peter parker 65 70 years old but yet is we can still accept uh, um, them as a young person so i think the whole story the whole narrative the whole business case behind this but yes there is a concern <laughs> that now disney are owning more and more of the content um and i have to full disclosure i signed up to disney plus and i and i got to watch a couple of shows and i um, i unsubscribed and let's see how this plays out because I now there are so many platforms i out there. still 100 percent hold to the fact that um, that Hulu will eventually become free and be entirely an ad-supported ad, yeah. network. I think yeah. that's the part, that's the plan that for Hulu, sense, yeah. and that Disney Plus is the premium streaming service that you pay a, 
a fee for. And I think it's a really smart strategy for them to have both in their wheelhouse. It's just that, you know, of course, they control everything now. Yeah, they, yeah but, they've it's, got, they've got network but it's channels. a little they've bit more than that, too. If you think about it, Disney Plus is really going to be all the family-friendly friendly PG, PG-13 PG content, whereas they can shove all the R-rated stuff to the Hulu platform. So if you think about it, they, they're dominating by taking over all the media companies, but the reality is, too, they can now shove that you know adult, harder-rated stuff to the Hulu platform and keep Disney Plus more for the, you know, for the f- family and PG-13 undercrowd. That's a great point, actually. It's not, yeah, differentiation is strategy. So they've got the ABCs and the ESPNs, they've got Disney and Disney Plus, and they've got Hulu. Right. So they've and got a whole landscape. Late, so late in the year, all. right? Late they in the year. They just Netflix now, and they'll be set. Late in the year, they even decided to can they're going to shutter the FX and FXX networks and move all their content over to the Hulu platform. So I think that's that's really that makes perfect sense. Yeah, it does make perfect sense, and it mm-hmm. you know it shows a and kind it, of. And it, Let's not forget, let's not forget ABC as well and ESPN. Um, so uh, they might, you know, to use a, a page out of Star Wars. This might be the new emperor. Yeah, yeah I was just thinking. I'm just trying to figure out how much is this Bob Iger still running it? Because what's his salary going to be? I'm, that's what I'm interested in. Because it's going to have to be like two billion or something in the next year <laughs> or so, based on all this value he's, he's creating for shareholders, right? Now, uh, one of the biggest, most controversial stories of the entire year, which seems to be uh, a non-issue now, I don't see anybody really getting upset about it, was Instagram removing visible like counts. Now, um, Lisa, this is your platform. This is the one that you love the most. Did this did this bother you? Because it, I, I, I it know, bothers me. It why bothers is this? Me. <laughs> why? Tell tell me why this. <laughs> well, bothers I mean, you. come on. I mean, look. Everybody doesn't win. Everybody doesn't get a trophy. Who cares if somebody has more likes than you? It's like if you, if you're jealous of that, then then grow your friggin' fan base to get more likes. I, I just think it's absurd that they're trying to hide what people get for likes. So me personally, look, there's a winner, there's a loser. You're not, you don't have as many likes as this person over here. That's just too bad. Either grow your platform, do something to increase it where you get more likes and stop being so jealous of everyone. There's always going to be somebody smarter, faster, younger, cuter. So get on with your life and just be, you know, I, I would want to see if I got, you know, 500 likes, why should I be blocked? Because someone next to me is jealous that I have so many likes. So I, I just think it's ridiculous that they're removing it. I, I, I'm really getting tired of, you know, how much people play with platforms. It's in addition to like that, I'm getting, you know, 800 ads instead of just a handful. So to me, it's like, I, I think they just need to quit worrying about everybody's sensitivity to the point that, you know, we can't see what people are liking on our pages. I, I think just to, the counter to that or push back is there's there is more and more data and evidence of the the psychological impact of these platforms. And I, I'm not an expert, so I'm not going to I won't I don't want to use language of addiction and those things. But there are behaviors and reward systems that these play into, and so. Part of it is real data saying, "Hey, this stuff is messing with people's heads, and the the so the 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 the, the value you get, the reward system is being in, incentivized by the like, and removing that will take away the the dark side and negative behaviors, these social behaviors or these these issues that humans have of being judged. And I think the analogy is, hey, every time you go to the bank, if you saw um, how much money everyone else had." it would cause you a problem. And that's the analogy they're saying, hey, that's kind of what's going on here. So I get, I understand, I un- I'm start, as you dig into it and start to read behind it, it's more about the impact on humans and human behavior that is driving this. And it's less of a business driven issue, the more just actually a human issue, which is quite interesting because we are wired the way we are. And so I, I think there's good, there's a good merit behind this. If, uh, but I equally, I think there's there's a good reason to be skeptical about how it's actually going to be implemented. And is there, uh, if we take that away, but now we can actually charge you more or control the message of, um, the you know, of your content and you know, essentially force you to buy more visibility than than and seeing what's happening organically. But there is a a dark side, a human side to consider that's driving this. So that's just I wanted to inject that into the conversation. Well, as if we didn't have enough ads everywhere we look, uh, you know, the cab toppers that are on top of New York City cabs and on top of San Francisco cabs and other major cities are now becoming digital signs and they're becoming programmatic signs. The first taxi toppers that are digitally connected 
have now begun rolling out in New York, San Francisco, a few other locales. Um, they can target things like geography, weather, um, all kinds of factors can be keyed in so that you can make your ad as targeted and as relevant and as contextual to the person's uh, actual physical environment as possible wherever they roam about the city. Uh, Joe, I think this is one of the most interesting, coolest, scariest opportunities for advertising that's come along in a while. What do you think? I, I don't. I mean, I agree with everything except for the word "scary." Um, I've been very, very bullish on uh, on out of home in particular, um, and to a degree, actually, even radio, especially when you think of uh, think of it in context of of, uh, of a moving car. Right? We always said advertising was about reaching the right person in the right place at the right time with the right message, you know, for the right result. Well, you know, out of home. And, and digitally infused and programmatically infused, et cetera, um, out of home is now giving you right place and right time. Um, and, and I think that's fantastic because if we want to save advertising or evolve advertising, this is, this is how to do it when we start really taking advantage of, um, you know, n- not just place and time, but actually even the person themselves becomes almost part um, of the message uh, in a sense. So, there's nothing scary about it, unlike maybe the the, the you know the kind of the cookie uh, story that we spoke about earlier with Instagram. Um, I just think it's it, it's terrific, right? It's just the ability to add even more context, more meaning, more relevance, um, and a bit of surprise and delight um, into uh, what was an old uh, form of media. Come on, it's like the jingle. They're trying everything. <laughs> you already get into a taxi and they have an ad, <laughs> so you know why not put them on the toppers? Yeah. yeah, but I mean, this this is you know, and 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 look, I mean, I, I would just add something, which is we're not just for me. My answer is is less about taxi tops, right? This is just more about out of home uh, itself, because because it's a bigger conversation than the just the taxi top, right? So you know, when you get into a taxi and you see the screens inside the taxi, I would agree with you, Lisa, completely there. Um, but I think the ability to put something on a moving, you know, moving medium or moving vehicle, um, it's a little bit of clutter in terms of adding, you know, more Times Square-esque, you know, messaging to our lives. Well, um, it's a cl- but if it's we a can cl- actually do it intelligently, it's great. The, the example that's always thrown out is, you know, you can have an umbrella ad on top of a on top of a taxi, but it's not going to be very relevant if it's sunny out. So if you can take the weather data and make sure that the ad is only showing when it's raining, suddenly you've got a really relevant contextual ad. And I know that's a silly example and no umbrella manufacturer is going to run out there and start running ads like that, but it does make some sense and it, it adds some understanding for what the possibilities are. Well, well, yeah, and if it's geolocation, think about it. If you're having, you know, in that particular area, maybe then you can run up a restaurant ad. Hey, hungry? Right around the corner is this. So, exactly. you know, it'll be amazing to see what they do with this as you go along with, you know, geotargeting and everything on that they can add to it. They'll mistarget the same way they do with every other programmatic device. You know that. Anyway. <laughs> Moving on, Facebook this year introduced their own form of currency, the Libra. <laughs> I don't know what to say about this. I, I, you know, Sam, I can understand why they want to do it. And I even can get behind the whole concept of why a digital cu- currency makes sense for them. But why did they think that they wouldn't have this massive backlash? Or did they anticipate it and just think that they could get by with it? I think they thought they could do it because they were Facebook. And when I mentioned the data on trust, I'm not sure if they took into account that the Cambridge Analytica, the shady data practices is all going to undermine this thing called currency. It's like money. So if you don't have trust at 90%, when you're trying to do this, you're not going to win. So actually, I think it should hopefully be a wake-up call because you saw all these partners bailing over time on that idea. And for me, it was kind of an interesting observation, like a lab experiment as a brand, you know, like a classic brand extension. If I am a, you know, a chip brand, can I make soda? Can I go, can I make car tires? Can, you know, and you, it, I remember when I studied, um, when I was going to do my, yeah, my, my, my thesis for my master's and you did the whole, um, you read David Aker and all these thought leaders on brand extensions and how far you could stretch the brand and where you couldn't. I'm just thinking, wow, 
they didn't do their homework. They do not understand what brand extension is. And this is a case study for 2019, 2020. So I think I actually kind of like it because you can use this as the modern day equivalent of, um, you know, like clear Pepsi, wasn't it? They tried that and it didn't, it didn't, it didn't work because the people don't like clear Pepsi. So I think it's just a brand extension failure, marketing 101, and hopefully um, there's a lesson learned, if not by them, just as a marketing case study from my perspective. Well, this uh, year at Cannes, there was one big, giant backlash over purpose marketing. Um, for some reason, Joe, everybody in the panels, everybody walking around the, the exhibit halls, everybody in conversation and social media reporting that was going on around the Cannes Ad Festival this year was talking trash about purpose marketing, like it was some kind of woke washing opportunity within the marketing field. Um, is, is purpose marketing a, a problem or is it just being done wrong? And that's what the backlash was about. I mean, I've, uh, if you've, uh, if you've heard me on the show or even just kind of in a lot of things I've been talking about lately, I've, I've been also purpose bashing as well. Um, Ooh. but, but I'll tell <laughs> yeah, exactly. Debbie Downer, uh, but but I'll tell but I'll tell you why because you know it, it became just you know this is the thing this is the thing with marketers is they're they're you know they're like a bunch of you know rabid lemmings they yeah. all uh, I you know or maybe another better analogy is six year olds if anyone has a six year old playing soccer right they oh. all bunch around the ball they have Jeez. no they, they have no coordination Rouge. you know yeah they they're they're just kicking in any direction and then one by fluke. Makes contact with the ball. The ball flies out, and they, oh. the herd, the herd just all moves from one place to the other. This is what was happening, right? Everyone got so excited about purpose, and all of these consultancies sprung up. and And my argument is, don't discover your purpose. Just remember your purpose, because you forgot your purpose, right? This is like McDonald's. Um, I was very inspired by the Bean Class episode when you guys, uh, you and Saul, Saul Colt, were discussing this, right? National Women's Day, the the McDonald's M becoming a W, get it from M to W, men versus woman. You know, they spend $2 million to turn the M into a W. And then, of course, the hashtag droopy boobs started trending. So, so the thing is, <laughs> this is just basically opportunistic, superficial, clueless marketing oh, trying to attach themselves to a cause oh. as opposed to authentically getting back in touch with why the hell they're in business in the first place. Oh, okay. Rent, it feels, rent it, over. Yes, it's, it feels like the counter. I, I, I now arise to put to, to for my perspective. So, I get the cynicism and the and and the the point that you're making there. It, it be, doing this badly is 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 an abomination. And so, calling out the bad actors, it's like the NFL every October, breast cancer awareness. Everyone wears pink, and then for the other eleven months of the year, there's kind of bad bad issues, a scandal galore and all sorts of shenanigans going on because do you really care about women's issues for the other 11 months of the year or just this one month when you make everything pink? So I can get this woke washing concern. However, the deeper um, the deeper premise behind having doing things for social good and social causes, I think has great merit and brands sh should lead the way because if we can't trust politicians and government and other institutions, can we trust brands more and can brands do more and companies do more? However, I think part of the problem is a lot of the people who are leading these organizations don't get it. They are um, often tend to be a homogenous small group of people making the brands and, and also making the creative. So you, you tend to get the snafus where the H&Ms and the Gucci's which are coming across with things which are racist. And I, I, I think for me, as you think about this space, who can do it well and how how can you do it well, which is a whole nother show. But I believe in purpose. I believe in brands with social mission. There's data that shows that brands with these social purposes actually growing faster. And you can do it whether you're a condiment, whether you're an insurance company like Lem Lemonade, whether you're a shoe company, whether you're even in um, in other industries. So like people like CVS, they have um, raised the, the standards for um, their, their whole beauty category. And so now showing... Um, showing products which haven't been airbrushed or photoshopped has become the standard. So in 2020, they're saying everything we show is not going to be photoshopped or airbrushed and all the beauty brands have to live up that standard or we're going to sticker the product which has been photoshopped or airbrushed. So the standard for beauty now is unadulterated, real people, not 
the beautified fake. And so that for me is an example where social good, social causes is actually translating into addressing the real issues of body image and body type as, as being, you know, thin and, and white being the standard and actually saying all types are welcome and we're going to show the reality and, of our products. I think that for me and, is, is, is well, delivering and, and, good and, for society in a way that purpose same. should do. And I, I just want to be very clear. I mean, I, I, it, it is one of the four growth pillars that I wrote about in Built to Suck, and I, but I call it corporate citizenship. And, and I think the point is, and, and this is where I think reconciles where we both, you know, where we're both coming from, is that when it, it, when it does become, or when it is nothing but superficial, um, mm -hmm. when it is tactics in, in search of strategy, you know, the one thing that I say is if you want to do good, you have to be good. And so yeah. When, yeah. We look, when we look at CVS refusing to sell tobacco anymore, we look at Patagonia changing their mission statement to saving the world, saving the planet, and, and not just saying it, but actually doing it in terms of how they run their business and run mm -hmm. their company. Mm -hmm. This is without question a mission critical part. But the whole idea of purpose, listen, when marketers discuss purpose, you know that it's basically going to end badly. Sorry not to say. If you, not if you have good marketers, because, uh, and I think that's where we're both on, on the same page and, you know, others jump in. But for me, let's save purpose by making sure we highlight and champion the good actors and we call out the bad, not to say we shouldn't do it. Because, yes, if your CFO is de deciding if that purpose has an ROI, then you're screwed. It should be bringing in the as i say that the folks who are trying to do good for society do good for their communities do good for the world and do good for their consumers and having a point of view and now taking political and social activism and taking stances on some of these issues i think for me one of the biggest movements that we shall see in the next few years is b corporations and those corporations which have to do good for the community and have to do good do good for shareholders equally those two missions are, are, are critical so you've got a company like danone which in the last few years become a b corporation 30 percent i think their business is around the world to becoming B corporations. And so there is there are movements that are actually changing how we do business. And even the business roundtable in October, which is basically a corporate lobby group in America and all the big businesses sign up to it. And in October 2019, they've said, hey, we have actually realized we've been doing it wrong for the last 40 years. Actually, it's not all about shareholder value. It's about employees. It's about communities and stakeholders as well as profit. And for me, that shift in how leaders are saying they're going to do business is also, I think, great momentum behind this issue. So Cannes a few months before said, hey, you're all doing it wrong. But when corporations and lobby groups are now lobbying for communities and social good as much as the, the shareholder, that for me is inspirational and aspirational. And so hopefully, Hopefully, as we move forward, we'll see more of the good and the good practices and less of the bad. But ultimately, we're going to raise equity for everyone by doing purpose well. And I will now step off my soapbox. Well, it seems like just <laughs> yesterday, it seems like just yesterday, Snapchat had this great idea to create something called the story. And now several years later, after Facebook has stolen it and put it on every single one of its platforms, Lisa, Stories is the most important marketing tactic that's come along in quite a long time, especially in the social media digital world. Um, it was interesting when Colin and Jonathan were on, Colin Glom and Jonathan Sackett, they talked about it had a, like a TV effect in terms of the experience. People were sitting back and watching story after story flip through instead of scrolling through this through the news feed. Um, is that the magic of it? And is that why advertisers are so excited about it? Because it has like a TV effect. You've got a lean back audience instead of a lean forward audience. You know, I, I, I suppose so. I can't say I'm a huge fan. I mean, I peruse through them. They're awfully short, so I'm probably not their demo you know, they're probably not targeting me. They're probably targeting younger people. But brands, you know, they're they're all over it and they really like it. So it's a little bit of hype for me. I, I, I don't really care for it. And I talk to a bunch of millennials. I say the 20-something generation really likes the stories. When I talk to kids younger than that, I'm not finding that they're intrigued by it. They're, they're kind of bored by it. But I can see brands jumping on this because it gives them that little window to grab people's attention right then and there so you know that they're seeing it. Um, so... It, you know, I'm not a huge fan, but I do see the appeal for it. It's quick stories. It's like watching YouTube. It's like watching something very quick where you can just, you know, go through the story. You can go through the videos as quickly as you want. So, um, you know, I, I, I don't really get it. It's not for me. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I, 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 I was going to say, I, I think what Colin and Jonathan said was very, very astute. Um, and, 
you know, it's almost an unexpected consumer behavior or behavior change. Um, it takes a lot of work. Um, it takes a lot of work, but but there's also a first mover advantage right now. For the most part, most consumers on these platforms are not actively creating and maintaining those stories. And so those that are, I think, are getting some unusual uh, lift as well. Um, so I just wanted to add that. Yeah, it's it's a fascinating tactic. Uh, I I personally agree with Lisa. It's not for me. It's not something that I've embraced wholeheartedly. I did one, I think I did my first story just last week, and it was horrible because I did it wrong, and I have no idea what I did wrong. So, I mean, it's obviously something I don't know a lot about, but it's it's obvious that it's become embraced by a number of people in my feed, and it's something that brands are getting some real value out of. Um, it's interesting. We'll have to keep an eye on it as we go forward. You know, another big trend from this past year was the shift from agency of record to project work is starting to take its toll on agencies. With one of the biggest high-profile closings of an agency as a result of the move from an AOR relationship to a project-based one, that was Barton F. Graff closing. Um, Joe, what's the future here? Do we continue to move toward project-based work and just have to figure out how we manage that with the, the level of teams that are necessary to keep employed between projects? I mean, what, what's, what's the deal here? I mean, I, I, I would just say something that I've said, uh, many times before, which is that, um, the role of the agent, right? The agency, um, is an important role. I think we need to a distinguish between advertising agency and agency in general. But for the most part, the key for me uh, is, was, and always will be compensation. And we haven't seen enough innovation and enough disruption in that. Um, and so, you know, as you as you correctly, you know, as you spoke about this idea of moving from the AOR, uh, the AOR cannot survive when the CMO, it's uh, him or herself, cannot survive. Um, and you and you just see those musical chairs. Correct. Now, the, the project based look, you know, is a management consultancy just not a glorified project based business? The only difference is their projects are a year and a half to two and a half years and cost seven to eight figures um, and involve, uh, you know, an, an intricate and complex amount of operational uh, development and deployment. So, you know, project work can work. Um, but I still want to see more in terms of um, royalty-based, equity-based, deliverable-based, right. value-based, performance-based. Yep. Performance-based, you know. yeah. 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 I mean, I, I, you know, I'm going to speak outside of both, both sides of my mouth. I think that it's inevitable in a P&L-driven world where performance marketing is deemed the right way and marketing and advertising is decided by the CFO instead of the CMO. So AORs will go away if the CFO and the spreadsheet decides everything. If the modern marketing p &L is in place where advocacy, where engagement, where um, capabilities are part of what's measured versus did, did you sell more or, more or less yes um, tomorrow, either decision will decide whether we do this or not. That, that's the current climate and this bifurcation of performance marketing and brand building and the realization I'm hoping in 2020 and, and, and beyond as we move forward is that you have to do both. And if you realize you have to do both, then the a AOR can can survive. If you're only going to do performance, then you're screwed. The other thing I always used to find weird with creative agencies is they used to make it as hard as possible to speak to the planners and the strategists and as hard as possible, they would keep you as far away as possible from the creatives. And so what they basically trained clients to do was to only pay for stuff they could see and actually didn't realize they were paying for producers, they were paying for strategists, they were paying for creatives, as well as other things. And if, if by not teach, training clients that all of this stuff was part of the value proposition, now it's become a procurement based numbers thing, lowest cost bidder wins, and clients don't want to pay for anything. And a generation of marketers have been bred who don't who have learned that you decide marketing through a PL and a spreadsheet and not through your eyes and ears and a human lens. If you decide marketing through insights, through creativity, through um, you know, empathy and all some other drivers, which you can't always put into a PL, then you would understand the value of agencies and especially creative agencies. And then you wouldn't have this issue. So if marketers can get back into doing marketing, if they can fight the battle in the, in the C-suite to, to define and um, 
elevate what marketing is, then the AOR can can come back. And I'm one of those marketers fighting that battle. And I'm going to call out all the marketers who are just spreadsheet warriors, who aren't great marketers, who are, I think, part of the problem in this um, in this space. And I think I built another soapbox to stand upon my prior soapbox, so I shall get off two soapboxes Well, it, it, moves us nice, it moves us nicely onto the next topic. Uh, 2019 continued the march forward on gaming opportunity. Uh, the marketing opportunities surrounding gamer culture are immense. They continue to get bigger. And yet, Lisa, agencies and brands continue to struggle on how to capitalize on it. Why is this so hard? It seems to me that everybody I know in the advertising world is a gamer. Why wouldn't they have the opportunity or the resources or the mental capability to figure this out by now? Well, because I think they're catering to a whole generation that we haven't figured out. I mean, if you think about everyone that's gaming, of course, there's a few of us older people that are still in this realm and some things do work on us, but but it's such a fragmented market now. If you know, if you talk to I have a seventeen year old, when he's gaming, he doesn't care about ads or anything interjecting that's trying to get his attention. So I think that it's going to take them a while to figure it out. I think they need to figure out how they're going to reach the 20 and under crowd um, and then realize that it is the 20 and under crowd that's playing Call of Duty along with a bunch of 40, 50 year olds and trying to figure out how they're going to, you know, capitalize on the gaming and really, you know, attach marketing that will work for it. You know, you know, we'll see how it, how that will go. I, I see ads all the time on TV, but I know these 20 year olds aren't because they're not watching TV. So I, I just think it's going to take a lot of, um, you know, sampling and, and trying different mediums, definitely YouTube, things like that to get attract people for gaming, but then also how are you going to track them within the apps that they're playing and in the platforms that they're on to, to make additional purchases and things along those lines. So I, I just think it's so fragmented on all who is gaming out there that there's not one way to reach them. And I think it's just going to take time. Yeah, for me, I, I look at the gaming culture and I think this is not one culture. I think you hit the nail on the head. It's it's a bunch of different audiences playing the same game. So it doesn't mean that everybody in that audience is driven by the same factors. I, I know that um, I wouldn't drink Dr. Pepper anymore, but if someone is 18, 16, playing one of these games, they might actually be interested in Dr. Pepper. It's, it, I think that it's, it's more about trying to segment out the audience and treat it like a television audience or any other kind of audience that's out there where you have different audiences uh, gathering around a, sa a similar product. doesn't make them all the same. It just makes them an audience that needs to be segmented appropriately. Well, um, another big thing that came up over and over again throughout the entire year was cancel culture. Um, Sam, I don't know what it is about this year that made cancel culture even worse than ever. I, maybe people had too much free time. Maybe uh, we've reached peak internet boredom or something. But cancel culture just took on a, a life of its own this year. And it seems like every single day there's another thing for the outrage machine to get worked mm -hmm. up over. Yes, and there are a couple of drivers doing that. There is a more, I think, liberalization of society because of demographic shifts, um, more multicultural households, um, the women becoming um, more educated and coming out of university. So society is shifting and the rules of society is shifting and the voices of those communities or those pieces of society who were perhaps more on the fringes are louder and, and more, more important. I think there's another data stat that says, look, you know, um, same male same-sex households and $60,000 more a year than other households. So a lot of communities now have more economic power, more, more social power, and raising their voice is perhaps rubbing up um, against the, main, the status quo and mainstream. So part of it is, hey, this is not okay. It was, it was never okay and calling people out. So cancel culture and call out cultures is, I'm not a sociologist and I can't go into the depths, but there is actually a lot of data to say why it's happening as a, as a, as a, as a, as a balance. So again, social media is one of the platforms. And if you know, um, social media communities, it is over indexes in, with black and African-American voices because they didn't have access to 
the mainstream um, t- channel. So black Twitter, it's not a thing. It's not a button. You could, there isn't a Twitter button with black Twitter, but black Twitter driving <laughs> and shaping culture. And no, I say that because a lot of people are trying to find where this black Twitter is. And it's like, I don't, I can't find it anywhere. It's so, it, I, well, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll pause there. But the, the, the idea that black Twitter is such an influential group and you've got brands like Popeye's, you know, winning, uh, winning from doing that and understanding that subculture. And I, I bring that up because it's, it's partially voices which weren't heard or weren't allowed to be heard before, before a, a la- have more more clout and more power. Uh, and so that's, I think there's a lot of good in that because ultimately it's about boycotting <clears throat> or calling out bad behaviors. And so having access to call out bad behaviors and bad things is good. The problem, the challenge we're facing in a very polarized society right now, there's a bit of an echo chamber. So, you know, there's always one side versus the other and people perhaps aren't let listening. Me, let, me, but, let, me, let me put this out to the, the whole panel then. <clears throat> put a frame around this. Is this an opportunity or is this a threat? Is this a threat to our brand integrity or is this an opportunity that we're ignoring that we could actually capitalize on? Well, I mean, look, every threat is an opportunity or every weakness is an opportunity in disguise. So, you know, I I went and pulled up the urban dictionary definition of cancel culture. And, you know, what is interesting is it actually says, and there's a huge grammatical error in in the description it appears, either that or I I can't read. Um, But it it talks about... (laughs) This is a direct result of the ignorance of people, um, but but as a result of communication technologies outpacing the growth of available knowledge of a person. So when we talk about fake news, right, like the antidote is this idea that people still need, maybe now more than ever, um, a knowledgeable, credible, authentic source or some kind of um, at least arbiter of of what is truth and what is real and what is not real. You know, when we think about um, all of this, this hype uh, and and hoopla, uh, the mainstream media, media, I should say, plays a huge, huge role. And I remember back in the days of, you know, the very, very early days, my first startup, Crayon, um, we were right at the beginning of, of, of Twitter. And we used to say to our clients, two things when we came up with a point of view on Twitter. We would say, the good news, your consumers aren't on Twitter. The bad news is that the journalists are. And so with all of these kerfuffles, we used to call them then, that now has become these massive, you know, kind of storms or tempests in a teacup, it's not until the mainstream media, it's not until the Today Show or ET or or, or mainstream media picks up on it and decides to kind of talk about it, that it really hits that kind of fever pitch as well. So there really are two parts to the story. One, of course, is is truth and ignorance and, and, and being quick to act and quick to react and take advantage of how easy it is just to put out bullshit, basically, sorry for the first swear word, you know, on social media. But, but it's also, but, but also, you know, it's not fair to blame social media, but also we should be thinking about mainstream media. So this really is a media and a culture intersection and 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 with that to your you know to your point and your question um are there opportunities and can we fix it i would have to believe and be optimistic that the answer is yes yeah i think brands are shying away and a lot of this is kind of why i kind of like it because when something goes wrong a lot of brands now are going silent which is the wrong answer it's the wrong thing to do and in the time where you know with, there's a recent I- example from hallmark where they banned the same sex ad uh, and there was it was amplified through social and they kind of backtracked and said actually maybe we shouldn't have banned the ad we apologize and it, co- it created so i i think there is if brands have to play play a role and this in the in the area we are now brands have to take a stance i just think the society in the world needs more empathy and with more empathy, this cancel culture will hopefully evolve into more of a dialogue and a conversation versus just shouting at each other, not you know talking, talking with, talking across each other, and now talking with each other and, and listening. So for me, there's a lot of good, but I, I can see how if you're a you know seen if you're from a business or marketing perspective, if you're a senior leader looking at Twitter, you're going to be frightened. And you're just going to say, turn it off, stop. We're, we're not going to take part in this. But I think from, from my perspective, we should be part of it and, and be forces for good and forces for, for change. And if you think about the Me Too's of this world and all the, um, these, these platforms which have shifted conversation and moved us forward, I think that it, it's a good thing. So the, a council culture can lead to positive growth for society and, and for us all. And I, I'm, I'm a huge fan of that. 
Lisa, we started this year off talking about influencers. Influencer marketing was all the rage. It still is. People still talk about influencer marketing. But now we're starting to move into this idea that meme accounts are the way to go. Um, meme accounts are just a lot like influencers, only they don't have the baggage of having an actual person. It's just the content that you're associating with. And a lot of brands are doing interesting memes, tagging on the memes, getting involved with memes, creating memes. Is this a lasting, uh, a lasting opportunity for brands to, a uh, lasting tactic that brands can embrace and use? You know, I don't know if it's going to last long term, but if you want to reach the under 18 crowd, you're going to need to provide this because uh, this is exactly memes are how the kids in my son's group, how they find uh, new products and stuff that they're interested in. And they're more into memes than they are into influencers as well. So I think this is a great way to reach that 18 and under crowd. I'd like to see what happens over the next few years to see if that's something that's going to continue to reach this younger crowd. But I think for now, it's it's super intelligent to do it. You don't have to be attached to an influencer. And memes are kind of the way to go with the, with the, the kids these days. So I think it's a really smart move for brands to be trying. I, I just love the fact that memes are a story. So uh, the, the world would be a, a, a worse place without memes as far as I'm concerned. And I, I'm not technically a kid anymore. I just feel that it's a, get another creative way. And again, this is shout out to Black Twitter here because I think if there was a Olympic medals for uh, memes, I think the, the, certainly the, the Black and African American community wins gold, silver and bronze because the most hilarious memes are from that that community and so what what i love from from memes is it's it gets more traction than the actual thing itself and so as a it's it's just a form of storytelling so i'm sure you know um people in in the you're going to look back and say oh remember in the in the sort of night i don't know 2000s when humans used to communicate by by a meme and no one would actually type or say anything it would only be the meme of it which would be the thing we'd rustle gravity um go go behind so for me i just love the storytelling aspect and from again from the marketing perspective what inspires me is there's a lot of cmos who cl are clueless in this space and they're going to have to give up control to the more junior members of their team and staff and go with it and so again i mentioned popeyes but a lot of brands now when you see the people who are driving this to marketing and brand success it's usually the 20 or 18 something junior person often female within the organization who is the star of the campaign or of the of the story so for me it's actually quite inspiring to see that it allows the creativity and the the content to come from a diverse bunch of people and so I'm I'm excited about what the the future of memes, baby Yoda memes, drinking sipping tea. That's, <laughs> baby that's Yoda. the hot one that's right now. That's all we need is more baby Yoda memes. <laughs> sipping tea, the sipping tea meme using baby Yoda. That's the thing right now, Bob. I know. I saw. It, I saw it. I know it. I know it. I also see the um, hydrogen peroxide experiments that go completely crazy. Those are pretty awesome. Oh too. lord. <laughs> so I guess I guess memes to influencer is Instagram stories to the feed. Yeah, probably. But is it meme or is it mem? Is it meme or is it mem? Okay, is it we're, GIF or is it GIF? Well, look, I think it's meme. We're in the we're in the home stretch here, guys. Stay focused. <laughs> Larry and Sergey stepped you, away Se from. Stepped Somebody mute him. <laughs> <laughs> Larry and Sergey stepped away from running Google this year, Lisa. Um, it seems like it's a monumental shift in Google's political future or whatever their, their whatever their corporate structure is but i don't know it seems like there's no effect to this it's not going to change a thing having larry and sergey stepping away from google what's your thoughts on this well, I think Larry and Sergey are smart to be running away from Google right now. I mean, they have their employees up in arms over doing government contracts. They've really opened up this environment that is like, we want our employees to really jump in and have a say in what we do. And now they're kind of like stepping back going, whoa, you know, the, the Google employees are trying to take over the campus. Um, but in all honesty, Larry and Sergey are not giving up control. I think what they're doing is stepping away to bring in new people to deal with all the issues that Google is now facing. And they, you know, they want to enjoy their billions and pull back and and kind of still have fingers into it but without having to be fully involved in dealing with all the sexual harassment charges and and all the issues that they're having at the google campus so uh, i think it's interesting that they're pulling back now uh frankly i probably would too but i i, I think it's uh I, I don't really think they're pulling completely out i think they're still going to be pulling the strings of the company they'll still be on the board yeah yes yeah, so it sounds like less work same money which i think most people <laughs> yeah. agree with that formula 
That sounds like a good plan. And last but not least, and probably the most important topic of this year, is the social platforms wrestled with what to do about political ads. Joe, this topic just came up again and again and again throughout the year. It's a holdover from last year, from the previous year. But it's grown in proportion just astronomically over this past 12 months. Um, And it's culminated with uh, Twitter pulling all their ads, uh, political ads from their platform, Google uh, trying to limit what kind of targeting you can do, Facebook kind of dithering on what they're going to do, trying to wipe their hands of the whole thing. What's going to be the result of all this wrangling over social political ads? I mean, listen, I'll I'll say just a couple things. One is uh, uh, thanks for your bold, brave move, uh, Twitter, but the damage has already been done. Um, You know, the the other thing is that I I would say is, look, I I think when it comes to anything digital, you have the ability to immediately uh, fact check or, or at least have some kind of counterbalance. And, you know, just like all influencer, and, and this is, I'm speculating in terms of what needs to be done, not clearly not what has been done, because nothing nothing great has been done uh, to date. But, you know, just like there are disclosures and just like there are call-outs with respect um, to influencer-based um, um, advertising or, or content, we should be seeing some kind of equivalent uh, for political ads as well. But, of course, this discussion is so much bigger because it's not just the advertising it's what it's 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 what appears to be content. It's the native uh, component as well that has just created uh, confusion, ambiguity, um, you know, disinformation. And the reality is, and I'm certainly speaking as 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 a consumer, I don't know what the hell to believe anymore. Um, so I think I think there are some you know, <laughs> if this topic's come up in previous years, is going to keep coming up. Um, and of course, you know, the business side of it is. You know, um, these have been bonanzas, just like Olympics were bonanzas for the networks. Um, uh, You know, elections have been bonanzas um, for publishers and for media companies. But but have they really? Have they really? I mean, it's just like when the numbers are crunched, uh, it's only a small drop in the bucket of the ad revenue that the social networks have been getting. And I don't understand what all the haranguing is about, why there's so much. I, I wasn't. Just just to say quickly, I wasn't referring to the social networks. I was re- I was referring to uh, mainstream, you know, to television, right. you know, and broadcast networks. So I think I think the whole thing is, you know, uh, look, when we have a conversation about social and digital relative to its terrestrial or analog or mainstream components, it's always been since since I published, you know, my my first book, Life After the Thirty Second Spot. It's always been about this idea: should we be held uh, to a higher standard, um, or should we just lower the bar to the same standards that everyone else has, or should we force everybody else to up their game and, ra- and, and, and raise the bar? And I think we all know what the right answer is, clearly. It's raise the bar and then and then exceed that. But until then, it's just been an, a bit of a mess. Well, I, I would say here is where I'm, I'm furious. There's two, you know, Jack Dorsey and Mark Zuckerberg have too much power to dither, and if they, if you, to run a TV ad, there's a higher bar, but to run it on their platforms, there's a low bar. That's un- that's unacceptable. So for me, I'm I'm very clear, and I'm not equivocating. They need to do better and be better. Jack, don't run off to Africa and you know find yourself for six months. Uh, fix Twitter. Mark, pull your finger out and stop listening to you know the powers that be to keep the status quo because it's harming society, and they're protecting their turf with what they're doing. And I I'm I, I use the platform, so I'm you know I, I I'm, I'm on Twitter. I, I use Facebook, so I can't say I'm not there. But I, it need, they need to be forces for good, and they they need to stop dithering. So that's my political soapbox that well, is um, you know absurd. i mean i'll be honest with you guys i don't have a problem with people running political ads i think what they need to do is vet them make sure that it's clear that's a political ad let me be intelligent enough to do my own research so if i'm on facebook and i'm unintelligent and i'm getting serviced a bunch of ads and i'm going to believe everything i see that's going to happen that's going to happen with people watching tv so set the bar make it clear it's a political ad and then run them i i, I don't understand this whole conversation around oh we have to really research 
everyone behind it. You know, I mean, it, the, the reality is, is we're stuck with the president we've got because, you know, only less than 30 percent of the population voted. So, you know, I'd love to get on a soapbox and say it's a bunch of political ads and, you know, people aren't intelligent enough to actually do their homework and research it. I think if they're clear, they mark that these are ads, they're political ads, just like any other ad. I don't see why we're arguing about it because we didn't like the outcome of the last election. I mean, if we don't like the outcome of the last election, let's do a better job next time and let's, you know, try to encourage everybody to get out there and vote. I'm not going to really stand on these political ads going, oh, people saw too many ads that weren't real, that weren't right. I mean, come on, politicians have been lying from day one. So, you know, there's going to be political ads, but a part of me is just like, I don't feel outside of disclosure that it's a political ad, that we should really be blocking so much of it. We should just have the same rules in place. Place that we do for television and every other thing. And if it's full disclosure, we need to treat people like they're, you know, adults and let them make their own decisions. Mic drop. Lisa, look, Lisa, you, and uh, you were going to say mic drop, but I just before that, before you do drop the mic, uh, <laughs> I just wanted to say, you know, according to Bob Garfield, one of the greatest quotes that I've always uh, run with is, is according to uh, recent statistics, and they've done extensive research on this, by the way, 50% of the population is dumber than the other half. Um, so don't think about that too hard because then I can tell you which half you're in. Um, <laughs> but I mean, that's, just, that's just off the bat. And, and I, I do think, I mean, I, I think everything you said is, is, is on, on the money and astute, and I don't think it's about arguing about election results. I think the thing is when we look at a digital and a social space, there is, everything is just too damn easy. It's too easy to create something. It's too easy to put, you know, to put it on the air or to or to launch it uh, or to create a campaign. It's too easy to share it uh, or 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 create a kind of call out or cancel culture protest against it. Um, and and that's the danger. The danger is, you know, uh, you know, we spoke about the low bar in terms of quality, but there's also an extremely low barrier here in terms of. Um, you know, in terms of action and behavior. And so I do think that that there is a bit of give and take here in terms of, you know, you made a good comment about the first part. I think about the second part is we do need to recognize that there there are a lot of vulnerable and gullible, you know, in addition to dumb uh, and lazy consumers out there. And there is a bit of responsibility that we as an industry and we as a country have to take. Well, Agreed, that but that's where they, if they set the bar, you know, and they actually make it fair across the board, then you got to treat the other half of the people that aren't that intelligent and that you do put in the dumb bucket. It's It's got to be their choice. I mean, it, it can't be just up to us to block everything because we're smarter than they are. Well, with that, okay, no more, no more. With that, it's time for the best of the fair, fail, foul. But before we get to that segment of the show, I do want to take this quick opportunity to thank my guests again and allow them to each do a shameless plug, starting with Mr. Joseph Jaffe. You can find him at thehmsbeagle.com. That's the home of his consultancy that he runs with Lynn Power. Tell us what's going on in your world, Joe. What would you like to promote? Well, I, you know, I have to say two things. One is that it, it wouldn't be fair at a year-end show uh, of The Beancast not to plug and promote The Beancast, the greatest marketing podcast ever. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, applause, and, applause. And, and, and let me tell you, across the pond, which, which, by the way, I was thinking, you do know that my first podcast was called Across the Sound. So I think, you know, great minds think alike and we're, we're in, the, in the right company, which is why I have to be on your show next year, Sam. Uh, but but uh, no, but just to just to go and echo and say, Bob, thank you for everything you do and, and everything that you contribute and and give to this uh, incredible community. Uh, you make us all smarter and it's a privilege to be a part of of the show. That's plug number one. Um, and, and plug number two is just a quick one, which is, you know, I uh, you know, talk about uh, coming full circle from writing articles on Click Z and Media Post uh, to launching Jaffe Juice. I'm now, you know, I've launched and having a lot of fun with, guess what, an email newsletter. And so if you, if you like me and my stuff or you hate me and my stuff, both work nicely, uh, you can sign up for my uh, weekly newsletter at my website, josephjaffe.com. Uh, and I would love it if you guys would do that. So, yeah, that's it from me. That sounds, that sounds interesting. Definitely go check that out. 
Uh, next up, we have Lisa Laporte. You can find her at artisanalagency.com and also at twit.tv. That's, she's CEO of both companies, so definitely someone you should reach out to if you want to get involved with her or, as our ad reference, want to advertise on their shows. So, uh, Lisa, what would you like to promote? Well, I just want to, pr- first of all, say happy holidays to everybody. And if you're interested in CES coverage, we're going to be there um, in January on twit.tv. And stay tuned because I'm launching four new shows in the first quarter, and they're going to be a shorter format. So if you're interested in tech, sure, be sure to check us out. That's great. And uh, I've said enough about your show during this program, so I'll leave it at that. Uh, definitely a network that you want to get involved with. Um, finally, we have Samuel Mani. He is uh, available at marketingtransform.com. That's the home of both his consultancy and his podcast, Across the Pond. So tell us, what's going on in your world, Sam? What would you like to promote? I just think between you and Joe, you, you got it all. You got the UL right, URL right and everything. So yes, I am a proud founder co-host of the across the pond marketing transformed podcast which was inspired by the great work that bob does at being so over the years i've been listening to marketing podcasts but i felt that there wasn't enough of me on the air bob and so marketing transformed.com is where you'll find us and we talk about all things marketing designed to inspire elevate provoke into action and we do leave you with with practical tips you can put into action normally in around 25 26 minutes is the duration of the show there so really excited about that that podcast um that we're doing and in the business of elevating and raising the bar for all marketers so check out marketingtransformed.com and the the show again is called across the pond marketing transformed my co-host is a guy called chris lawson who's based in the uk and he's an awesome co-host and uh, we we're enjoying doing that so that's what i'm going to plug on this show bob sounds good sounds good And as for me, for more information about me or the show, visit thebeancast.com. There you can find a complete show archive. You can find out how to consult with me. You can find out how to advertise on the program. And of course, I've been promoting this. If you want to give back to the show, we have a number of ways to do that. We have a PayPal donation button. We have Amazon wish list, the whole deal. So just go to thebeancast.com and get all the information about that. And now for, it's time for the best of the fair, fail, foul, a rundown of the best and worst of marketing, advertising, and public relations from the last year. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to do three for each. Um, the fair, first of the fairs for this year has to be the Harry Potter Times Square takeover. Did you guys have a chance to take a look at this? I mean, anybody take a look at the, what they did? I mean, 52 screens across um, Times Square were taken over with one giant 15-minute presentation to show the launch of Harry Potter and the Cursed Child in, I think, three more three more locations around the world. Um, it's spectacular. Uh, Joe, did you see it? No, uh, no, no. I, 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 I didn't. But I mean, I, I will just make a make a comment, which is what's great is to see. You know, we think of Times Square as maybe one of the uh, inarguably media wonders of the world. And I think number one to take over the entire Times Square is is phenomenal. I don't know if it's ever been done before, but but if it hasn't, even better. And the second thing is also recognize from a media standpoint that something like that, you know, has legs, you know, and has the ability to be captured and, and rebroadcast. And so it becomes like an earned media extravaganza. So we see it working you know, we see it working, you know, uh, on two levels. Now, next up, the, the next one that I loved was Warframe, which is a video game, introduced the latest version of the franchise with a spectacular stunt. They basically gave a gun to a random passerby and they told him to shoot at a cop car. And the cop car just rips in half. It's just amazing what they did with the technology. I mean, it's just like make it into this completely viral event. Um, I'm not sure if anybody got a chance to see this one, but this is one of my favorite ads or uh, guerrilla marketing events of the year. Sam, did you get a chance to see it? I, 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 Sorry, this is like zero out of the two here. I didn't see it, Bob. I'm not a gamer, but this kind of... I want to check this out because um, there was this viral moment that I missed. So thanks for bringing it to my attention, and uh, I'll have to I'll have to take a look. But I, I I didn't see it the first time around, Bob. But I'm just gonna, I'm going to find out now. 
what now, it was all about. The the best of the year, the thing that I know all of you have seen, South Dakota's meth were on it campaign is, in my opinion, one of the most brilliant moves, Lisa, that I've seen in a marketing so campaign brilliant. for a long time. I mean, because they basically took everybody's desire to troll brands for doing stupid headlines and turned it on its ear because they went meme when they went to a total meme level with this campaign that was completely tongue in cheek and everybody took it wrong and tried to make fun of them and ended up promoting the fact that South Dakota has a meth problem. Right. No, I thought it was a brilliant campaign. And, you know, I, I, I just would love to see more people really calling people out on it, especially the brands that have really, you know, helped create this meth problem that we do have. So I, I thought it was brilliant. I did follow this campaign all year, and I just think um, I wish more people would, you know, get behind it and help resolve the issues rather than continuing down this road of having all these sick kids. Yeah, and what I loved about that is if you look at the classic case study, if you read about what they tried in the past and hadn't worked, and so at the end of the day, it was they did something that did work and did actually cut through and got people's attention and awareness. So kudos for them to actually sticking at finding, using marketing and communication to solve a real issue, which is going to, as I say, for a social cause and social good. And this is, the, I think, a great example of the power of advertising and marketing for, for good. Now, yeah. in, in the fail categories, um, the fail category winners, first up, <laughs> Circle K Mexico runs a Secretary Day promotion for chocolate, wine, and condoms. I saw this, and I thought, who who was in this boardroom? Who thought this was a good idea? I mean, I know it's, you know, I don't know. Is it worse than it's in Mexico? Is it better than it's in Mexico? I don't know. But it's it's a terrible idea all the way around. Uh did anybody get a chance to see this? Yeah, I think I saw it. And, um, and it was just, and I talked earlier about there's a lack of empathy in the world. And it just seems like this is another example where they tried something with a nod and a wink and a bit of innuendo. And it was, it, no, this this is not funny. Who who could possibly think it was a good idea? Yeah, it's a, it's a true idea. So it sadly actually did make it into the world. So that, that's puts, the sad part. Puts a new spin on candy wrappers. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Joe. Yeah, that's good. You talked about raising the bar, Joe. Oh, my gosh. Well, talk about I, raising the bar. I didn't say I would. Oh, okay. Talking about raising the bar, Forever 21 included an Atkins diet bar in plus size orders. Now, as it turns out, they included diet bars in every single Everyone's one of their like order. It. But for God's sakes, you might want to think about what the message is you're putting out there, Lisa, when you put out a package to a plus size woman saying, here's a diet bar for you to go along with that dress. Yeah, I just kind of groaned because it's nice when I walk into Target to see normal female size models. It's like, wow, we finally made a breakthrough. And then you read something like this and you just want to cry a little. Um, <laughs> yeah, I just don't think it's 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 the right approach. And, and maybe like now that you've said they put it in all the orders, I feel a little bit better. But you're right. I don't want to open up my package if I'm, you know, plus size and, and see a diet bar. I mean, that's just... That's a huge fail. Now, my favorite fail of the year is one that I I haven't seen a lot of people talk about, but I thought it was like incredible. Uh, there's a vibrator maker called Vibees, and they did a Mother's Day campaign, which is already groanable. You know, we're going to do a special vibrator campaign where we're going to give it out to moms, which you can see. OK, so a husband gives uh, a vibrator to his wife or whatever. That's an acceptable scenario. And she's a mother. Okay, I understand that. But the hashtag is what killed it with the hashtag wow your mom. And I'm thinking, <laughs> who is going to give a vibrator and then tweet about it with a hashtag wow your mom? <laughs> a very b brave child. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. I was trying to find this on, on Google. I don't know what, what search <laughs> lockdown I've got, but nothing was coming up, Bob. So I don't know if this has been scrubbed from the internet and the ether forever, but I literally couldn't find anything when I put the hashtag into Google. So unless I'm doing something wrong or I'm in denial or I've got some some cookie blockers or something, I don't know. It didn't, it didn't seem to work on my computer. Bob. I, I saw so. the email campaign and I think I was the only one who caught it and made a big deal about it. So I guess I'm not meme worthy out there, but this is one of my favorites of the year. Um, now oh, I the... found it. Just Google it. <laughs> yeah, my, my Google does not work, and I, and I will stick to that, and I will plead the if anyone challenges me. I, I would rather not, but thanks. Well, the fouls of the year. First up, um, I'm going to say the 
General Mills RFP comes up first. The General Mills request for proposal was just incredible, Joe. It, it asked for um, exclusivity. It asked for no, it gave no payment to the agencies for participation. It said it owned all the work and it wasn't even going to um, guarantee work in the end for any of the agencies. It wasn't going to say that there's only going to be one chosen. I mean, this RFP was every bad behavior that we've come to expect from brand RFPs rolled up into one RFP and the entire agency world went nuts. We went ballistic over this. It, it is so sad that, you know, that, that when we've seen this kind of tension between brand and, and, and agency, and just when you think all the agencies will hold the line and say, you know, kind of let's stand in unity, there's always someone, you know, we talk about bars being lowered. There's always someone that will go lower, right? There's always someone that will respond, um, whether it's just, you know, opportunism or desperation, et cetera. But, yeah, I mean, I, I think that ultimately the, the you know, we've discussed this so, uh, so many times. When brands and agencies recognize that the future of this business is on the line, that's the first time that we actually kind of join hands and join, you know, forces and figure out a better way to make sure that that great ideas and disruptive, you know, ideas see the light of day and, and help transform these companies. And until that happens, we're just going to continue to sink further and further into into this quicksand. Hey, hey so, Joe, Joe, we're sinking because one of the things I read about that article was it was they were asking for 120 day payment terms. Oh, and yeah. There's been another snafu about um, a company recently which is now asking for 150 days. So we're still the bar is still sinking from the from the client side, sadly and um, unfortunately. Mm. No one learned from that case because 100, 150 days. I mean, really, that's this is kind of standard for RFPs these days. I mean, we do RFPs all the time. They don't they don't respond to you. They expect you to give them everything. This is nothing unusual. And frankly, I agree. I think the creativity is going to drop. And you know, I have clients coming at me looking for 180 day payment terms, what? and I'm just like, well, I'm not a bank, really? so what? I got to hit my line of credit and six months. Later, you pay me. Days? Yeah, brands are really Come. huge. Brands are really pushing, and they're trying to get uh, everything I, I and guess, everything they can. Wow, they might as well just go three hundred sixty. This is three sixty, three sixty-five, or whatever. Yeah, why not? Yeah, why not? You know? yeah, just make it a year. Uh, well, we don't have to pay anybody. Well, talking about lowering the bar, Google sexual harassment problems have reached just peak performance this year, Lisa. I mean it. You know, as we discover what uh, Andy Rubin was paid on his exit, we discover uh, how women are being treated within the organization. We talk about um, uh, the way that executives have been kind of shielded from the consequences of their actions. Uh, as more and more of this stuff comes to light, Google looks dirtier and dirtier. Um, what's your take on this? Uh, well, I think they should know. They should have never paid Andy Rubin when he left. I mean, that was just absolutely absurd and ridiculous. And they've since laid off, I think I was reading another 50 people without uh, severance packages. And I they probably should have started with Andy and just releasing him without one. So I, I think they're going to get what they deserve. I mean, they did remove from their arbitration agreements that sexual harassment it, it is no longer in there. So if you want to go after Google and sue them in an open court, you can now. You're not being held to an arbitration agreement. But I just think this is more of the Me Tours, everything that's been happening across the board that, you know, companies are going to have to step up and clean up their 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 entire company. And, and I think they should do this without compensation packages. It's time to nip this and yeah. it's time to lay people off and yep, to reward them that. with a $90 million package when they walk out the door. What does that tell other people? Oh, you just keep keep harassing. It doesn't matter. Well, the the I, I don't know. Arguably, whether this is the biggest foul of the year or not, it certainly was one of the more um, exciting spectator sports that we had over the last twelve months. Was the WeWork non IPO? Everybody was excited about WeWork's IPO. Everybody was talking about it. Everybody yeah. was saying it was going to be the biggest thing ever. And then Joe, the uh, it came out that the CEO was not playing above board, that the numbers weren't straight, and suddenly WeWork is kind of struggling to survive. Not only did they not IPO, they're every day wondering whether or not they're going to survive for the next month. I mean, this is just absolutely crazy what went on with this thing. Yeah, t t you know, totally agree. And, and look, I will say I've been a big fan of of WeWork, and I continue to be a big fan of the idea, of the concept, of how this is 
transformed the way that we work. And, and I didn't mean that, you know, pun not intended. Um, but you almost kind of, like, I almost sensed that there was something uh, amiss or awry when I would walk through, and, and you would know this being in, in, in Manhattan, Bob, you, you know, you would walk through the streets of New York City and literally every other block, you know, your phone would go into the WeWork network or Wi-Fi network. And you think like, seriously, how many WeWorks can there be on this tiny little island? You know, so this was a company that, that grew way too quickly, that wasn't able to manage their growth, and more importantly, wasn't able to manage their people or, uh, and, and some of these bad habits and bad pra uh, practices. We saw a little bit of it in Uber, and, and there was swift action taken there. Um, so I, I'm, I'm going to remain hopeful um, that, that we will see uh, uh, a second round for this company um, because I believe in the consumer behavior and I believe in ultimately, you know, the, what they've brought to, to the market. But, but wow, what an unbelievable implosion at such a high, at such a high visible level. Absolutely. And I just got a note saying, can we do the Peloton ad? And I'm like, no, I'm not going to talk about the Peloton oh, ad. We can't do a marketing show without <laughs> talking about the Peloton. I'm not going to talk so about the I Peloton ad. That was hysterical. Peloton. Come on. I bought my wife a Peloton and it was okay. So I want to say it to the world and to lots of men sure. out there. I bought my wife a Peloton and she was happy. I was happy. It was, everyone was a winner. So it is true. But did you, you hold her account? Did you hold uh, her accountable and uh, make her do videos to show her progress? That's the Joe, thing. are you going to back me up? You did the same. Is that what you're going to tell the world, Joe? No, no. I'm just, I'm just going to basically say, if anybody would like to save, uh, save Sam's wife, who right now is being held captive in the basement <laughs> until she becomes a size minus two, there's still time. No, look, I, 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 I will back you up. I, I, I wrote an article actually in my newsletter on this, and I said, you know what, this was, this was a, you could see the brief, and it was a, a strategic brief about gifting Peloton to, of course, the one percenters of the world. And unfortunately, the creative execution was just oh, sadly lacking. Yeah. And all they had to do was portray the husband as a flabby, you know, somewhat overweight male huh? Wait, who, sneaks I don't like this down, who sneaks down into the basement or the first floor in the middle of the night because it, in fact, is he who becomes addicted and, need, and needs the Peloton. But, you know, regardless, the fact is, for those of you, for people that have Peloton, it's not about if weight you remember, loss. If you it's, remember, it's about correctly. lifestyle. It's a great product, and it will continue Joe, to be great. If you, re if you remember, every if you remember correctly, that's last year's Peloton ad, where they each bought the Peloton bike for the other one and then used <laughs> it for a year. Okay, in secret. Okay, it's just like you're you're missing out on which Peloton ad you're talking about. Wow, this you is know, gonna be a trilogy. They just need to flip it and have the woman buy it yeah, for her just husband, do it again. and then there would be no complaining. Like I bought one for Leo. He loves it. He's down 25 pounds you know well, i'm supporting him <laughs> so next next year's story is going to be someone who buys a peloton for their 14 year old child or something we need the, the trilogy of peloton ads so please <laughs> peloton, peloton help us out cancel peloton <laughs> cancel peloton all right well have a suggestion for this you, list you, or you, just... hey, Bob, you've lost Bob, control bob, bob i have control, bob. they're getting punchy when, <laughs> when, when samuel said can we do peloton as well can I assume the answer to that was no? Okay, sorry. <laughs> I'm just no. trying to wrap this thing up. Okay, have a suggestion for this list or just want to discuss it? Comment online. Use the hashtag fair, fail, foul. That's pound, fair, fail, foul. And that does it for this week's edition of The Beancast. If you'd like to subscribe to this podcast, visit our website at thebeancast.com and click on the subscribe link. If you're an Apple Podcast listener, we've also provided a direct link to our listing there. Or just search for The Beancast in the podcast directory on the Apple Podcasts app. And whichever podcast directory you use, when you subscribe, please leave us a review. Got a comment? Have a question? We'd love to hear from you. Just send your emails to beancast at gmail.com. Opening theme was performed by Joe Seibel. Closing theme by CJax. Thanks for listening. I'm Bob Norp. We'll be back again in two weeks after the holidays. So hope you'll join us then.
like, um, it's like, you know what I mean? It's like, it's like, like, if it's, you know what I mean? Um, I don't know, man. Just like, okay, it's like, um, you know what I mean? Like, it's like, totally like that. It's like, uh, it's like, it's like, I don't know, like, if it's, you know, it's like, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's just like, kind of, it just seems like it's just like almost exactly. Exactly. 